the Committee on Zoning, and will the Zoning Committee please come to order? At this time, I'd like to welcome Committee, oops, one, two, three. Good morning once more. Will the Committee on Zoning please come to order? At this time, I'd like to welcome Committee Vice Chair Los Santos, Tam, Tyler, okay, Council Member Cordero, okay, Radiant, and Council Member Matt Weyer. Council Member Kia Aina will be arriving very shortly also. <clears throat> Although remote oral testimony is being permitted, this is a regular in-person meeting and not a remote meeting by interactive conference technology under Hawaii Revised Statute Section 92-3.7. Therefore, the meeting will continue notwithstanding loss of audiovisual communication with remote testifiers or loss of the public broadcast of the meeting. Members of the public will be allowed to provide oral testimony on all items on the agenda in two ways, remotely and in person in the council chamber. Persons entering the council chamber to testify are requested to spread themselves out. If the chamber becomes too crowded, persons may be requested to wait outside the chamber until called to testify. Oral testimony will be allowed when each agenda item is taken up in the following order. First, remote testimony. Okay, one more time, remote testimony. And number two, in-person testimony in the council chamber. Before testifying, each person shall state their full name and the agenda item they are testifying on. Each speaker may not have anyone else read their statement and is limited to a one minute presentation per item. A one minute presentation per item. All persons who have registered to testify remotely by video conference of, or phone <coughs> shall be called upon first. When your name is called, please monitor your screen and activate your audio feed when prompted. The following, <coughs> the following are some friendly reminders and tips. Video conference from a quiet location if possible. If you are watching the proceeding on Olelo, please mute your device at the time you are called to testify. When the timer on the screen reaches zero, please conclude your remarks promptly. For those who are joining us by telephone only, I will identify you by the last three digits of your phone number. When your number is called, please press star six to unmute yourself when prompted. Once all the remote testifiers have testified, I will proceed to have the in-person testimony in the council chamber. Persons who have not registered will be given an opportunity to speak following the oral testimonies of the registered speakers. Written testimonies, including the testifier's address, email address, and phone number will be available to the public as described on the posted agenda. As a courtesy, please turn off all cell phones. So let's move on to agenda number one, but before we do that, may I introduce Vice Chair Esther Kiaina, who is also present. It's an update by the Department of Planning and Permitting on the Coastal Zone Management Act and Special Management Area Permits. The reason why we're having this informational briefing right at this point in time is that on the agenda, committee members, there are three items of discussion for this hearing today. So I'll call upon the administration, Ms. Dawn Takeuchi Apuna, the Director of Department of Planning and Permitting. Good morning, Chair, members of the committee, uh, Donna Puna, DPP. For this first informational briefing on Coastal Zone Management Act and SMA, I have our um, chief uh, planner, Liz Krieger, to provide some information to the committee. Thank you. Okay, please proceed. Good morning, Chair and members. Thank you so much for having us here today to discuss uh, how the Coastal Zone Management and the Special Management Area works. Um, I'd like to keep this as brief as possible, so I'm going to talk quickly, and uh, I'm available for any questions you have. Um, the state of Hawaii began regulating the shoreline in 1966. They started having a regulation about the zone of wave action 
followed by a regulation in about 1971 that established a shoreline setback. In 1972, the Federal Coastal Zone Management Program was enacted and the state followed up with a State of Hawaii Coastal Zone Management Program in 1977. Uh, currently, today, uh, the Coastal Zone Management Program is found in Chapter 205A of the Hawaii Re Revised Statutes. There are 10 objectives and policies of the Coastal Zone Management Program. So I'm going to read through them because you'll find that every time we send a report for a special management area use permit or major permit, we follow these 10 objectives and policies to discuss how the project that you're reviewing is consistent with them or how it might be mitigated to be more consistent with these 10 objectives and policies. The first is recreational resources. Second is historic resources. Third is scenic and open space resources. Fourth is coastal ecosystems. Fifth is economic uses. Sixth is coastal hazards. Seventh is managing development. Eight is public participation. Nine is beach and coastal dune protection. And 10 is marine and coastal resources. So again, these objectives and policies are not limited to just SMA permit projects. They are also broad policies that tell the state and the city and, and the other counties uh, how to uh, enforce and enact our coastal zone policies. But it is the case that for SMA use permits, we identify each of these policies and objectives and discuss them in the reports uh, to um, show how the project is consistent with those policies. So I'm going to read next the, um, a couple of quotes from the Coastal Zone Management Act. Uh, it is the state policy to preserve, protect, and where possible to restore the natural resources of the coastal zone of Hawaii. So that gives us the broadest policy statement. Uh, and then, uh, more specific to the SMA, the, the code says, special controls on developments along the shoreline are necessary to avoid permanent losses of valuable resources and the foreclosure of management options and to ensure that adequate access to public owned or used beaches, recreation areas, and natural re reserves are provided. So um, the, the state delegates the administration of the special management area to the counties. Uh, therefore, we, prom we, the city and county, process most permits that are on the island of Oahu. Um, and to implement the Coastal Zone Management Act, we have adopted chapters 25 and 26. Uh, chapter 26 until recently was chapter 23. Uh, and so there, if I say 23, please forgive me. <laughs> um, I think that that's probably enough quoting out of that code. So now I'd like to discuss more broadly how the SMA works on a site-by-site on -site basis. Um, when a project is in the SMA, the first question is, is it considered development? D development is defined. Development includes almost everything. It includes moving earth, filling, trenching, putting up a fence, paving, putting up a building, it can include almost anything. So the first half of the definition of development includes almost everything. The second half of the definition of development carves out specific exemptions, including repair, agricultural uses, uh, structural repairs to homes, that kind of thing. Um, when a project is uh, considered development, uh, it does require an SMA permit. There are two types of SMA permits. There is major and there's minor. So a minor permit is required when a project is valued at less than $500,000 
and is considered to be a project that will not have a significant impact on the coastal zone resources. Uh, a major permit is anything that has a valuation at greater than $500,000 or a project that is less than $500,000 $500, that also may have an impact on the coastal zone environment. When, uh, when an applicant requires an SMA major permit, at present they need to get an environmental assessment or an environmental impact statement, and then they need to go to the neighborhood board, after which they submit an SMA permit to the Department of Planning and Permitting. We process that permit, we hold a public hearing, and then we draft a report and recommendation and transmit that to the city council. Those reports are usually lengthy because, like I said before, we're trying to cover each of the, the policies and objectives. Um, however, they're full of good information and they're pretty concise, particularly if you're concerned about one issue area, you can go to that section of the report and find it relatively easily. When we transmit the report and recommendation, we also transmit a, uh, a draft resolution and that is our recommendation for how the, the city council might adopt the uh, SMA permit. So the SMA permits are adopted via resolution by the city council. They're often um, conditioned to mitigate any impacts that we have identified or that were revealed in the EA process or were revealed by any comments from other public agencies, stakeholders, community members, neighbors. All, we get information from all kinds of people that is very useful in our analysis. Standard conditions are usually related to lighting um, we find that uh, shielded lighting and making sure that lighting is not projecting across the uh, shoreline into the coastal zone area and the conservation district is very important. Uh, we have conditions relating to landscaping, when landscaping can and cannot be removed based on uh, say the Hawaii, Hawaiian hoary bat pupping season and that type of thing. Uh, and then of course we have standard stop work orders relating to findings of archeological and historic and cultural features. So that's uh, the long and short of what we do. Um, it is definitely the case that the special management area is a management area. It's not a substitute zoning code. Uh, so it does not direct what types of development can and cannot be on those zoning lots. Um, however, it is the case that sometimes in order to mitigate impacts relating to the development, uh, there will be times when conditions will be imposed to um, specifically talk about the siting, where the building can be on the property, how far set back the building can be, and the appropriate location based on things like the flood hazard area, the um, sea level rise exposure area, wetland areas, stream setbacks, and that type of thing. So um, we have been doing a lot of SMA permits. Act 16 2020 uh, included uh, all residential shoreline properties as being development, which previously had not been the case, which means uh, you are seeing three to four SMA major permits at every zoning committee hearing. So, um, so again, the idea is not whether the, um, whether the project is appropriate for the zoning. The, pro the question is what are the impacts to the coastal zone and if there are any, how can they be mitigated? So I'm available for any questions that you may have. Okay, members, any questions <clears throat> at this point in time before we take other testifiers? Thank you very much, Liz. We'll call you back later, okay? At this point in time, we'll now proceed with the remote testimony. Clerks, do we have any remote testifiers? Chair, there are none. Okay, but before we move on, is there a Steve Cottonbue? Uh, Stephen Cottonbue, may I ask what uh, item will you be testifying on? I see his name up there. Steve, would you like to unmute yourself to just share with the committee what... Yeah, my apologies. Um, I actually came in through here uh, to watch 
the presentation. I didn't mean to actually be on the testimony. My apologies. Okay. No problem. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Let's proceed with the remote testimonies. Clerk, do we have any more remote testifiers? If not, Chair, there are none. Thank you very much. Okay. And now we'll proceed to the in person testimony. We will now proceed with the in person testimony. Clerks, do we have any at this point? Chair, there are none. Okay, thank you very much. Since there are no in person testimony or remote testimony, members of the committee will now have the discussion on the SMA program that we have. Any questions for any of the members of the committee? If not, oh, uh, no, I just wanted to say mahalo, uh, Chair, for um, having the info briefing to kind of bring us all up to speed. So okay, appreciate great. that. Okay. Well, Liz, you got off real quick on this one, so thank you very much. But you have to stick around for the others on the agenda. Next, we're moving to agenda item number two. Update by the Department of Planning and Permitting regarding the status of all pending land use ordinance amendments. Members, please note that DPP, the Department of Planning and per Permits updates are available for viewing online as Departmental Communication D-87-2023. Here is the administration, Ms. Director Don Takeuchi Apuna. Uh, mahalo, Chair. So yes, I think you have the report. And if you have any questions, we're here to answer any. Members. This is the report that they have for us. If there's any questions for any of the members, we could re ask our director. <clears throat> Resolution 19-305 that was introduced 11-820. Description is the land use ordinance re relating to wind machines. It's with the status, status is with the planning commission, 20-293, 10-29-20. Land Use Ordinance Amendment relating to farm village communities. DPP's recommendation was to deny the resolution. To deny, the resolution was adopted by the Planning Commission on 11-24-2021. An alternative proposal for farm worker housing was included in Bill 10, which Chair, Vice Chair Kia Aina will be addressing Bill 10 of 2020. 2022-32, uh, which was introduced on 217-22, land use amendment relating to the Chinatown Special District to require a special district permit for distribution of free food, wait, food of free of charge on the public sidewalk. So that will be aff affecting Vice Chair Dos Santos Tan, your Chinatown District, okay? And finally, 22-254, 22 land use ordinance relating to overhangs to allow overhangs in the required yard and into the right of way in Kaimiki. Con DPP confirmed receipt and provided comments and questions on December 5th, 2022. So that particular issues are all part of the resolutions that were introduced this past year. So for the last one, number four, I think Chair Waters will be looking into the report of the Department of Planning and Permitting. Is that correct? Okay. So we'll now proceed with remote testimony, Madam Clerk. Chair, there are none. Okay, thank you very much. In-person testimony. Madam Chair, any in-person? Chair, there are none. Okay, great. Now we'll open up to any questions or discussions that the members may have on the report. Okay, Council Member Wire. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, and Director Puna, um, I was just going to ask, uh, understanding that amendments to the land use ordinance go through the Planning Commission, what does it look like if, um, you know, portions of that bill built in specifically, for example, are broken out and put into another bill? Like, how does that work? Does it get stricken from built in or can yeah, you share I think, anything about that? Oh. Yeah, I think so. I think it's possible if it's, uh, you know, the council or the committee's pleasure to pull out parts of it and treat it as a separate bill. And then I guess when Bill 10 comes about, they can delete those provisions or those amendments. Okay, so we don't have to revisit the, uh, the commission. I'm sorry? We don't have to revisit the commission then because it's coming I don't out think so because yeah, the commission covered those subject matter areas. Okay, mahalo. Mm -hmm. And I just asked Chair, because I know that I've seen the few bills introduced that relate to Bill 10, so I was just curious. 
Okay, any further discussion? If not, thank you very much, Director Apuna. Member, let's just move on to agenda item number three, resolution 22-296. This resolution grants a special management area use permit to Mr. Ken Stiles and Rick Angiola to allow the construction of a new three-story single-family dwelling and individual wastewater system on land zone R5 residential district located at 67-433 Waialua Road Beach Waialua Beach Road in Waialua and identified as tax map key 6-7-013 colon 034. Joining us in the council chamber, we have Mr. Ryan Facer, the applicant's agent, to give us a brief description of the project to the committee. For your information, members and the general public, the presentation is available online as miscellaneous communication 53 of 2023. Okay, Mr. Facer. Oh, excuse me, yeah, go right ahead. Thank you, council members. Appreciate the opportunity to speak regarding the Stiles residence, as, as mentioned. Uh, council members say, give a great explanation for the zoning designation as an R5 residential zone. Uh, the project site <clears throat> is located as seen on this aerial view at 67433 Wailua Beach Road in Wailua on the North Shore of Oahu. Um, let's flip to the next slide. You go, well, actually, before we move to the next slide, you can see here a clear designation of residential area already established and has been established for more than 50 years in this location. Um, so the project site location is surrounded currently by uh, single family residential homes. Um, and then the next slide we can see a clear enlarged view of the aerial shot of where the Stiles project resides. You can see on the right hand side of the slide there are, all, are already two residential homes already built on the ocean front. The Stiles project site sits just back behind those two ocean front homes. Um, but as mentioned in the informational briefing, which was fantastic, thank you, um, the, within the SMA jurisdiction, the Stiles residence still has to comply with the requirements of environmental assessment and the SMA use, special use permit. The next slide shows the improvement. So as noted in the objectives and policies of the coastal zone management, again, that was described in the informational briefing, um, we can see before when the site was raw, it was basically a dirt field with some field grass, just fill land. Um, since the purchase of the site by the owners, um, there has been an introduction of 125 plant species, most of them native to this location. Um, we won't read them all in detail, but there is a lot, and we'll see in the subsequent photos um, how the enhancement of this has been achieved. Again, going back to the objectives and policies of the SMA, um, we can see how the owners of this property have really tried their best to uphold those scenic resources, cultural resources, um, and natural resources to enhance the environment. So again, here's the, pro the, the Styles Project site. Um, we wanted to take you through a brief photo tour of what, of what the enhancements look like. Um, so you can see the uh, letters A, B, C, and D as vantage points, which we'll see in the subsequent photos. Um, so A is looking um, inward toward the Styles uh, residence uh, project site. You can see they laid down field grass in the middle, again, to keep dust control down as they're going through the Department of Permitting and Planning to get their permit to build. They wanted to make sure that the dust mitigation was controlled. They have gravel in the front where cars are occasionally parked for landscaping. But even more importantly is the extensive landscaping that has been introduced on the three perimeter sides of the property. Um, you can see a, a variety of different types of palms and shrubs and plants that have been planted. Uh, looking back from the other direction, in the distance on the left-hand side of the photo, you can see those two oceanfront homes that sit on the sand. But again, back um, in a closer view of the photo is the improvements that the owners have provided to the project site. Again, a lot of uh, plant life introduced. We have Samoan coconut trees in the uh, left-hand side of the page. Uh, again, a variety of different palm structures um, lining the three perimeter sites. 
Um, looking back from the inside portion of the property, looking back, you can see those same Samoan coconuts on the left-hand side of the page and the palms uh, wrapping around the border uh, or the perimeter of the property lines. And again, looking uh, Malka this time, again, uh, looking at the side of uh, the other side that we hadn't been able to see from the photos, again, noting an extensive array of palms and shrubs and different plant wildlife that will enhance and foster um, natural reintegration of birds and other uh, wildlife to the area. And again, more photos. There's a lot, 125 plants in this, in this uh, property that have been introduced uh, before building has started. Um, we also wanted to share just a quick snapshot of the front elevation of the home. Um, as noted, R5 residential zone already established in the immediate vicinity surrounded by this property. Um, it's uh, uh, elevated because they are in, in the adjacency of the flood zone. Um, but other than that, you know, traditional styles of architecture, multiple roof pitch lines to make sure that it doesn't look out of place. And again, with the surrounding vegetation that's been introduced, it should blend well with the natural surroundings and community. Um, as mentioned um, in the informational briefing, the Stiles residence has already gone through the robust environmental assessment process, which is an extensive process reviewed by public organizations, including Department of Permitting and Planning. Um, also included uh, the North Shore Neighborhood Board. Um, the project was reviewed and approved by them last summer. Um, so we've, we've included that letter here. And then most recently, um, again, as described in the informational briefing, we held a public hearing in December of this last year um, with the Department of Permitting and Planning. And the Department of per Permitting and Planning have uh, uh, recommended their approval for the SMA special use permit for this project. And that is the end of the pre presentation, and we're open to questions if there are any. Thank you very much, Mr. Fazer. Any questions for the agent? Okay. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Fa Cordero, oh, please. Thank you, Followed Chair. By okay. Thank you, Mr. Fazer, uh, for your presentation. Relating to the dense uh, vegetation that's planted along the interior, it says here on page five. Um, does that mean that the rooting will be less damaging to the um, surrounding infrastructure and um, to the property? Is that what dense vegetation is there for? Mostly in line with the objectives and policies of the SMA, um, it's to reinvigorate and reintroduce those environmental um, benefits. Um, for wildlife, um, for the community, for the culture, and generally the any, anything that may have been potentially adversely affected by development is the introduction of all this plant life um, for all the reasons mentioned and the objectives and policies. Um, the owners have, have been very aware of these requirements and wanted to do their best as stewards on their land to try to reinvigorate wildlife um, and just the overall aesthetic of the community with um, improving it from what it was before, which was just a, a, a landfill, or not just a fill land and grass field, what it was before. Um, in addition, and to answer your question, um, the owners did build a lava rock wall that was permitted by the Department of Permitting and Planning. Um, so that kind of contains their area. So in terms of root spread or growth, it should all be contained within their, their property lines. Okay, thank you very much for your explanation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Member Kiaino. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation and a thank you for uh, informing the neighborhood board and getting the response uh, when Councilmember Suniyoshi and I uh, reinserted that requirement, we never intended it to be an impediment. Uh, what uh, we have seen is that when well, communities are not notified, um, it here. could be problematic when you're at the final stages. So the fact that you did that and then they attempted to, uh, I think is uh, sufficient. Uh, and it looks to me as as though the owners of this property, the homeowners uh, are gonna care deeply about the property. So I assume that they are not gonna have short-term rentals on this property. That is correct. They've actually sold their prior uh, primary residence and anticipate to have this be their primary, primary residence for, I hope, the rest of their lives. Okay, good <laughs> to here. hear because um, 
and, and, and trying to create communities. Um, you know, it's good to have people who are committed to actually living there and being part of the community. Uh, your application indicates that the property is located on Jockus Sands, which is known to contain Evian historic artifacts. Was an archaeological monitoring plan required for this project? It was not required, although through the um, required adjacent municipal organizations, the state of Hawaii Historic Preservation Department was notified of the project and shared the environmental assessment with their organization. Um, they provided comments to say if anything of import was discovered during the, the, the project process to notify them. And so we've been in connection okay, with their organization. Okay, and then I just want to confirm. So DPP did not require an archaeological monitoring plan? Correct. I don't know if it was previously developed and subdivided by a developer. It may have been required at that point in time, but I'm unaware of that requirement. And then lastly, uh, the application indicates that based on the state sea level rise viewer, the property will be inundated by annual high wave flooding as early as the 2060s. How has the applicant accounted for this impact with their proposed development? Yes, so the project is built approximately eight feet above sea level currently, and that takes into consideration, let me flip to the front elevation slide so you can see that, um, that takes into consideration the next hundred years um, potential impacts for sea level rise. Um, so there's no occupiable space below that um, elevated first level structure point. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, best of luck. Thank you. Council Member Wire. Thank you, Chair. Mahalo again uh, for the presentation uh, and just engaging the council uh, and the committee, rather. Um, so first, I just wanted to clarify. So I know it's three stories. Can you just describe what the first story looks like or what it entails? Yes, it's basically um, under house space because it has to be raised on structural columns to achieve the sea um, level height that is required by the flood zone. Um, so it's just space underneath the home. Okay, maybe parking down there too, it looks like. They do have parking space, but otherwise it's just open void space beneath the home. Okay, so otherwise it would be a two-story home if it was on the ground, yeah. That's okay. correct. Yep. Uh, and then can you just outline the, um, again, the, the wastewater plan and system? Yes, in compliance with uh, uh, the state of Hawaii uh, requirements for every 10,000 square feet of a septic tank um, for new builds. Um, the Stiles residents will have a brand new septic tank um, installed for this residence. Okay, thank you. And then I also echo um, Vice Chair Kiaina's comment about, you know, thank you for engaging the neighborhood board. Understanding they didn't take an official position in support, but um, they did decline to agendize it and noted they felt like it was in compliance with all the, the zoning requirements. So I'm all over for that outreach. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you. Any further discussion? Council Member De Los Santos Tam? No, nope, no questions. Okay. Next, let's call upon the Director of Department of Planning and Permitting, Ms. Don Takeuchi Apuna, for the department's position. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the department is supportive of this resolution. Okay, any questions for the director? Okay, Council Member yeah, Kiyana. Just a follow up um, on the uh, archeological monitoring plan. Uh, uh, the applicant said it was previously done. So did you believe that it was um, still good or did you, uh, I mean, I, I guess I'm trying to understand, did you guys determine that it was not needed? Um, I'm not sure about the specifics of why it wasn't necessarily required, but I think the conditions in there that um, the gentleman spoke about as far as if um, something is discovered, work needs to stop, and they need to uh, contact Shipty or whichever officials are. So I think that that covers um, any potential um, fines, but I don't think that yeah, I think that covers it. We didn't think that um, uh, analysis was required. Okay, thank you. Okay, Council Member. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Director, if you could just expand on that a little bit on why you didn't feel additional analysis was required. 
I'm going to have Zach, who's the planner that worked on it, um, provide Perfect. further explanation. Hello. Morning. My, my name is Zach Stoddard. I'm a staff, VPP staff, who worked on this report. Um, in the environmental assessment comments were received from the State Historic Preservation Division, indicating that no historic properties would be affected. And so in that case, a project of this size, generally speaking, um, we just include the standard stop work condition that if cultural resources are found during construction, uh, they must stop work and contact Shipti. Okay, mahalo. Does that, does that clarify your concerns? Though, on it does, person? Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Any further discussion for the department? Thank you very much, Mr. Stoddard. May we proceed on, members, to the remote testimony? We will now proceed with remote testimony. Clerk, Madam Clerk, do we have any remote testifiers? Chair, there are none. Thank you very much. Madam Clerk, are there any in-person testimony? Chair, there are none. Okay, if there is no person's in testimony, in-person testimony, we'll now open to discussion on Resolution 22-296. If there is no further discussion, at this point in time, the recommendation is for the adoption. The chair recommends that Resolution 22-296 be reported out for adoption. Any discussion? Okay, objections or reservations? Hearing none, so ordered. Congratulations and best wishes. Okay, members, moving on to agenda item number four. Resolution 22-276. This resolution grants a special management area use permit to Barbara Pollen to allow for the construction of a single family dwelling with a two car garage and supporting infrastructure on approximately 18,992 square foot shoreline lot zone R5 residential district. Located at 57-321 Pahipahi Alua Street in Kahuku and identified as tax map key 5-7-003 colon 057. Members, we have posted to the agenda a proposed CD1 version of the resolution for your information. A summary of the amendments is listed on the agenda. Joining us, joining us in the council chamber, we have Jim Hayes, from Planning Solutions, Inc., the applicant's agent, to give you a brief presentation of the project to the committee for your information. The presentation is available for the general public online as Miscellaneous Communication 55-2023. Okay, Mr. Jim Hayes, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Jim Hayes, representing the Pollen family, the applicant for this SMA permit. We have a brief presentation um, to start, just talk about the process that we've been engaged in. We sent uh, scoping letters in advance of an environmental assessment back a little over a year ago in December. A uh, draft environmental assessment was available to the public in April. Uh, we discussed the project with the neighborhood board. They declined uh, to have a presentation. We completed a final environmental assessment, which was available in August. Uh, the DPP held a public hearing in October. Uh, not listed here is that uh, we then requested an extension for this SMA permit consideration due to the holidays, and that's where we are now. So to get an understanding of where the project is located, it's on the west side of Cavella Bay uh, in the Pahi Pahi Alua neighborhood. This map shows the special management area, the entire area, um, Makai of Kamehameha Highway is in the special management area. This is a zoning map showing that the residential community there on the west side of Cavella Bay is zoned R5. This is a zoom in on the project site, the TMK specifically. And it shows the existing residents. Uh, this area has been used for residential purposes since at least the 1940s. And there are residential uh, dwellings on both sides of the subject site. Couple photographs of the existing conditions at the site. 
This is from the shoreline looking at the existing residence. It's a, a modest dwelling that's been there again since the 40s. Uh, typical landscape uh, consisting of coconut trees, nopaka, sea almond, things of that nature. This is from the roadside, again looking at the residence with the parking area in the foreground. The roadways in this neighborhood are not paved, uh, they're gravel roadways, so uh, very country style. This is a plan of the site showing uh, the planned dwelling and the shoreline there in blue. And you can see that the uh, parcel actually extends beyond the shoreline officially, uh, but the private ownership only extends to the shoreline. So the project site is actually much smaller than what the TMK uh, indicates. And you'll see that this, the, the site or the proposed dwelling is very much on the Malka side of the property and providing a 60-foot setback from the shoreline. So a quick review of the compliance with the land use ordinance. Uh, the lot is of ample size um, and the development will comply with all the setbacks and yards, maximum building space, maximum height. The height of this proposed structure will be 26 feet 3 inches and it exceeds 25 feet because as with the previous project it has to comply with the flood elevation so the the height limit in this situation is 30 feet it's well within that uh, and consistent with nearby dwellings um, floor area ratio well in line and the maximum impervious area will be only 28 percent of the developable area Couple renderings of the project. This is looking at the Mackay side of the proposed dwelling. You can see that the ground level, which is below the base flood elevation, is not a living space, but uh, storage, parking, and just outdoor lanai area. The upper floor is the living area and consists of all the, the standard bedroom, kitchen, uh, et cetera. This is a rendering from the road side of the project, again showing the uh, garage space in the middle of the ground floor, storage space on the right side, and then the living space on the upper floor. And that's the end of our presentation. We thank you for your consideration and attention to this permit application. Thank you very much, Mr. Jim Hayes. Any questions for the applicant? Okay, Council Member uh, Wire. Thank you, Chair. Um, and mahalo for, for the presentation. Could you just walk through again um, the wastewater setup and what that's gonna look like? Uh, the wastewater, um, it will be an individual wastewater system. It's hard to see on this drawing at this scale, but it's over on the right side uh, near the roadway. Uh, so typical uh, designed for a situation like this where the septic tank can be accessed for maintenance uh, and a setback from the shoreline. Uh, in this case, it's roughly uh, 90 feet from the shoreline. Okay, mahalo. And, then, and like you said, mahalo for engaging the neighborhood board on their June 9th meeting. Um, though no um, you know, official support was given, they didn't object or have, you know, object to the project. Thank you. Um, and then I might call up Director Apuna, if I may. Oh, yes, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Mahalo, Director. Mm -hmm. um, just um, given some, you know, th this discussion, not necessarily in relation to this particular project, but when we're looking at um, septic system placement, how does that factor in with sea level rise? Because I think it's great we're seeing homes go up, right, um, to accommodate what we're going to see as a community. but septic of course is underground yeah i mean i think we look at each project separately and see how it can be accomplished or integrated in the project i don't know if uh, my staff wanted to address more Perfect. specifics about how they evaluate and um, make sure that it all works out so liz krieger can okay, thank you director thank you miss krieger hello elizabeth krieger land use permits division um Wastewater is an interesting question. Most of 
most of the island, of course, is serviced by sewer. So in this neighborhood near Kahuku and along, you know, so along the windward side and along the north shore, there are certainly areas that are on septic. Um, the septic is reviewed by the State Department of Health. So in most cases, we're deferring to them. We are certain to reach out to them and the applicants work with them because they need their approval of the individual wastewater systems. So in some ways, um, we're somewhat hands off when it comes to that uh, analysis. Sorry, mahalo. Yeah. Um, no, that, that's extremely helpful. And then I also uh, might be you that could clarify, just in looking at the um, discussion that came up during neighborhood board, particularly related to endangered um, species in Ivi Kupuna, um, said they didn't um, take a position, but I think some folks during the board just asked questions about it. And then um, I'm just wondering if you can provide any insight or maybe Director Puna on, on how evaluating impacts on stuff like endangered species, Ivi Kupuna, how that plays in. Yeah. Sure, uh, just to clarify for a moment, the microphone wasn't quite working. So you're wondering about impacts to flora and fauna as well as historical and cultural resources, is that right? Spot on. Okay, yeah. um, we, during the EA, as well as during the SMA permit process, route the application to um, a number of agencies at the state, county, and even federal level that have expertise in those areas. Um, over the years, we've gotten a lot of similar comments from, say, the uh, DLNR, Department of Aqu Division of Aquatic Resources, or Division of Forestry and Wildlife, or the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. And they have a lot of on online resources that discuss what types of species might be found in a certain area and what types of mitigation measures will make sure that uh, residential, especially development on the shoreline, will not have um, much of an impact. There's, you know, I mean, there's a question of any, any development could have uh, impact, but the way we mitigate it is by talking about when trees over a certain height can and cannot be chopped down based on when the, the hoary bat pupping season is, when, um, uh, when seabirds might be traversing the property, that kind of thing. So again, the lighting requirements may seem somewhat pedantic where we're talking about how like a residence needs to give us cut sheets and specifications on what kind of outdoor lighting that they're gonna put in, but that's what we find uh, based on state comments would have the most uh, impact in a positive direction. Um, in terms of historical resources, there's a big conversation to be had there. Um, as you know, we're in the process of establishing a historical commission, which is very exciting at the city and county level. Uh, I'm hoping that with the establishment of that commission, we will be able to have better um, better specifics that applicants for SMA permits can go through, where rather than feeling like every single one is a brand new project, they know that this is what we expect them to do before they even come in for the SMA permit. Because a lot of the time, the um, mitigation measures are very similar. So there's, there, um, they either will do some trenching on a bigger prop property where they know there might be historical findings, they might do some boring tests to see if they discover anything, but really, uh, absent of digging up a whole property, they're not gonna know until the actual earth disturbance happens. In some cases, they want archeological monitoring on the site while the digging is occurring. Um, again, those are often for bigger uh, commercial projects, but um, we do have, we do require that the stop work order be placed on all construction plans so that everybody on the site during construction can see that should they discover inadvertently any archeological or historical finding, they need to stop work immediately. It tells them who to contact, it tells them what they need to do to proceed. So. Um, those are the number of ways that we attempt to prevent future impacts without disturbing the entire site to see if there will be impacts, if that makes sense. Makes perfect sense, and it's a lot of due diligence. And so I know the community 
um, and myself also appreciate all the work that you folks at DPP are doing. Um, so we can ensure that you know we're watching, looking out for the community, but also supporting good projects like the one we have today. So mahalo. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much, Council Member Kiaina. Uh, Liz, you probably could answer this, um, although the applicant is the one who conducted the archaeological monitoring plan. Uh, when someone does the plan, uh, who's notified? Is Shipti uh, Oha or the Oahu Burial Council uh, consulted during the archaeological monitoring plan? Do you know? Uh, uh, I, I don't know exactly. I know that Shipti has um, their high Chris system where projects get inputted into their digital system and that they, um, they sort of do a series of reviews and kind of acceptances. They, they tend to, um, they'll require a certain level of review and should any findings occur, they require an additional level of review. I do not know how well they communicate. No problem, I will ask the uh, applicant because I have another question, but before you leave, I just wanna say, um, I look forward to the Oahu Historic Preservation Commission being stood up, but one thing that DPP can undertake immediately as you probably know, an, uh, an archaeologist position was authorized in the last budget, and um, that could be stood up immediately because I think that uh, it's probably going to take a while for you to fill the position. And so when the board holds its first meeting, it would be nice to have um, an archaeologist on board. So uh, I just wanted to uh, say that. And for the applicant, if you could... Um, answer my question with regard to um, who was consulted. Uh, I just want to know if either three parties I mentioned, ship the OHA or the, o or the Oahu Burial Council was consulted. During the preparation of the environmental assessment and the SMA permit application, we have reached out to the State Historic Preservation Division. Uh, we're continuing to consult with them now. Uh, to answer your earlier question, when a project is required to do an archaeological monitoring plan, it is reviewed and approved by State Historic Preservation Division prior to its implementation, but uh, the Burial Council is not involved in archaeological monitoring plans. Or OHA. OHA is consulted and made aware, but they typically... Oh, okay, so you, they were consulted. Oh, yes. Oh, I'm sorry, you didn't say that, so yeah. uh, good to hear. And then um, my last question, of course, is uh, do the owners intend to be owner occupiers here or are they, uh, are, are they looking to um, do short-term rentals? Oh, no, they won't be renting. Uh, they'll, be, they'll be the residents there at the property. Okay, thank you. Okay, following up by Council Member DeSantos. Oops. Liz, uh, could I um, quickly address the one council member Kia Aina question? Um, the DPP always makes sure that the application for SMA permits are routed to OHA. Um, I misunderstood your question thinking that the question was more about the archaeological monitoring plan and whether that specifically was routed to OHA. But yeah, we definitely always consult OHA with our SMA permit applications. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Council Member DeSantos Tan. Okay, um, this is just a really quick question. Um, I noticed in the application it indicates that the property is zoned R5 and also P1, but on the exhibit B map, it just seems to indicate R5. Is this just a product of the shoreline coming up onto the property, or is there something else going on? I, I, I believe that the the zoning on the developable part, so Mackay of the shoreline is R5 entirely, and then maybe the P1 is um, beyond the shoreline. And as it's uh, mentioned and stated in the permit, the proposed permit, any land that's Mackay of the shoreline is not owned by the property owner, it's owned by the state. Okay, Let's introduce yourself, state your name. What Hi, you um, Jordan Dildy, staff planner, DPP. Yes, please, Jordan. So I just want to clarify the R5 and the P1. So as the applicant was stating, um, the R5 portion is everything that's Malka of the shoreline, uh, certified shoreline area, and the P1 is 
Mackay of that certified shoreline. Okay, thank you very much for the clarification. Any further discussion, Council uh, Member Kiaina? Can I just make a comment about plants? Because uh, people uh, talk about native plants a lot. So uh, I just want to make clear to any of the uh, applicants that, and, and, and by the way, it wasn't with this project, it was with the previous project, um, that uh, native plant species indigenous to Hawaii or Hawaiian canoe plants that were transported are are, and have been around for a long time are good. A lot of the uh, plants, including a lot of palm trees, are actually not native. And But it's up to, uh, it doesn't have to all be native, but I just wanted to make that clear because uh, people confuse the different degrees. And there's various, uh, a lot of the palm trees are neither native or Hawaiian canoe plants. Uh, they are um, recently introduced plants. So I just want to make sure uh, as DPP planners are working uh, with applicants that we just make that clear. And I'm not, um, you know, uh, good diversity is okay because I do believe that uh, uh, I, I like a lot of trees because my, my family is from a uh, plant um, business. So I was raised in that and I do agree that uh, birds flourish uh, in a lot of the, the different plants. And so I think it's good, not just for the uh, owners, but also for the neighborhood. So it's all good. I just want to make sure that DPP planners in um, counseling the applicants, um, just uh, educate them on that. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion, members of the zoning committee? Before we proceed on, let's introduce our chair of the city council, Chair Tommy Waters. Thank you very much. So let's moving on. At this point in time, we're going to amend to the Resolution 22-276, oh, excuse me, yes. Madam Clerk, are there any remote testimony? Mr. Chair, there are none. Thank you. Madam Clerk, are there any in-person testimony? Chair, there are none. Okay. Members, we have a discussion. Any discussion before I make the motion to adopt with a committee draft one? Okay, at this time, the chair recommends that resolution 22-276 be amended to the posted committee draft one. For the edification of all of us and the general public at large, these are the proposed committee draft one amendments. Amends the resolution title to remove the tax map key abbreviation and conform the format of the tax map key to the standard format. No space following the colon. B, in the third whereas clause, updates the resolution to reflect that the ordinance provisions being implemented by the permit are provisions of the revised ordinance of Honolulu of 2021 instead of the revised ordinance of Honolulu 1990. C, as a fort whereas clause stating that on November 21st, 2022, by miscellaneous communication number 517 of 2022, the applicant's agent requested a 60-day extension to the decision-making process on behalf of the applicant, and the extension was approved on December 7, 2022. D, in the bid resolve clause, condition E, revises the list item two to state that the site work and construction activities are limited to daylight hours at all times, instead of only during seabird pledging season. Two, revises list item three, to remove the statement that barbless fencing must be used for all fence construction because barb fencing is already prohibited by the building code if you see revised ordinance of Honolulu section 16-1.1 of 33. And three revises list item four to clarify that a 300 foot buffer must be observed only if a monk seal pup is present. Otherwise, it's a 150 foot buffer that would be sufficient. And E makes miscellaneous technical and non substantive amendments. So, those are the amendments to the committee draft one. Are there any discussion? If not, objections or reservations? If not, hearing none, the resolution has been amended to us, committee draft one. At this point in time, then the chair recommends that resolution. 
Committee Draft 1 be reported out for adoption. Any discussion, objections, or reservations? Hearing none, so ordered, it is adopted. Congratulations. Let's move on to agenda number five, resolution 22-293. This resolution grants a special management area use permit to Parkies Renaudos to allow for renovations and new construction at Sea Life Park on land zone P1, restricted preservation district located at 41-202 Kalanahanaole Highway, number seven, and identified as tax map key 4-1-014-004. Members, we have posted to the agenda a proposed <coughs> committee draft one version of the resolution. For your information, a summary of the amendments is listed on the agenda. Joining us in the council chamber, we have Barbara Natale, Jeff Overton, and Valerie King from Group 70, the applicant's agent, to give a brief presentation of the project to the committee. For your information, the presentation is available online as miscellaneous communication 51 of 2023. At this point in time, we'll call upon Ms. Barbara Natali. Barbara? Or Jeff? We're on? Good. Thank you very much. Good morning, Jeff Overton from G70, Principal Planner. I'm here with our Associate uh, Senior Planner, Barbara Natali, and uh, also in attendance is Valerie King, the General Manager for Sea Life Park. So thank you very much for the time. Originally established in 1962, Sea Life Park is really a, a cherished icon in our community, important place for all of us, uh, for environmental education, conservation, and as a gathering place. Coming out of COVID, the Sea Life Park needs to refresh and improve its facilities. And today we have a short presentation. Barbara's going to lead, and uh, we welcome your questions after that. Thank you. Good morning, council members. Um, this is Barbara Natal. Um, I'm going to run through the PowerPoint just real quick here, just to give an overview of the project. Uh, the project Sea Life Park is located in Waimanalo in the northeastern portion of Oahu um, near Makapu Beach Park. It is located within the special management area. Therefore, we're here this morning for the SMA use permit. Uh, it, the land is owned by Department of Land and Natural Resources. The primary lessee is Oceanic Institute, and Sea Life Park has a sublease uh, from Oceanic Institute. Uh, this is an overview of the area. Uh, to the left of the highway, you can see Sea Life Park, and on the right-hand side, more of the coastal area that I wanted to just um, Note that this area is Department of Hawaiian Homelands. We did have some questions of that. Uh, again, Sea Life Park is uh, owned, uh, the land is owned by Department of Land and Natural Resources. One of the primary missions of Sea Life Park is animal care. Uh, one of the only, the only breeding, uh, green sea turtle breeding program is located at Sea Life Park and they have um, released 17,000 baby turtles since the inception of their program. And of course, they also take in uh, seabirds that have been injured, and they don't necessarily keep them on property uh, unless there's just no way they can survive. Um, majority of them are released back into the wild. Sea Life Park is in compliance with several uh, Animal Welfare Act uh, several animal welfare acts, and um, they're working for their Associ Association of Zoos and Aquariums certification. The improvements that will happen in this project will help them to attain that accreditation. Uh, the secondary uh, mission of Sea Life Park is their environmental education. Uh, in addition to the signs that are located within the park and the interaction that people can have when they go there, uh, Sea Life Park works with schools both inside the park and off property. And uh, additional community partnerships, uh, I'd like to focus on uh, the Waimanalo Limu Hui. So um, one of the great things that Sea Life Park does is they uh, grow the limu on property, and then this nonprofit group, uh, all volunteers, comes and harvests the limu, and then they put it back out into the ocean and several properties around the island. Uh, here's an overview of the project. This is existing conditions. I'm sorry, this is a little dark here. Um, if you've been to this property, essentially you're, you walk in. I don't think I have a... 
any kind of a laser pointer, but um, I'll, I'll just, this is what it looks like now, and I'll walk through the remaining uh, improvements that will happen. There's uh, 11 areas of improvement. Uh, this property, or the improvements will stay within the property area. They aren't expanding outside of the current property area. Uh, and I'll go over the projects here. Um, as you walk in, there's an entry concierge uh, building that is dilapidated. It's time to, um, we'll end up tearing that down and build a new one. Um, as you walk through, uh, if you've been there before, you go in the shark cave and then you walk all the way down in the circle and out you come to the uh, Hono Conservation Area. And currently there's one pool, uh, there's another pool behind it that is uh, where the sea rays are. This will be taken over to expand the um, Honu Conservation Area. Uh, to the right of the shark uh, cove, that circle, um, will be the Ocean Oddities Aquarium. This will be the um, really the main uh, building that will be new construction. Currently there are just some um, back buildings at that area. And then at the current Luau um, location, uh, Sea Life Park is looking to uh, make a nod towards the Kaupo Fishing Village that used to be in this area and they'll work with community groups to um, give educational and cultural uh, uh, presentations and in these hale that are located in the area. Um, some other highlights, uh, the, of course, the seabird facility will remain, but it'll just be moved around the location. And then that beach, um, beach boil and I facility, the kitchen will be uh, updated, and then there will be a really nice um, lanai that will look, overlook the park and out into the ocean. This is a rendering of what the uh, entry concierge facility would look like. Sea Life Park has been through uh, various, um, all the permitting process that's necessary. Uh, the federal uh, final environmental assessment was accepted in May of 2020. Um, there were presentations that were given to both the Waimanalo and Hawaii Kai neighborhood boards. Um, once COVID hit, we did need to take a break and uh, Sea Life Park focused on taking care of the animals and stopped the permitting. Um, so just fairly recently, they were ready to move on with this, the SMA permit. Um, with this SMA permit, we are required to give presentations to the neighborhood board one, uh, once again. So we did do it to Waimanalo um, Neighborhood Board as well as Waikai. Uh, went through the public hearing process and um, we are here today in front of the zoning committee. We expect, um, if all goes well, um, building permits to begin in the spring and it'll take approximately five to 10 years for the construction process. We did have several subconsultants for the environmental assessment. Um, the archaeological inventory survey did not find any uh, sites in the area. Um, uh, from previous surveys, it's been approximately since the 1980s that they last found something. Uh, no endangered, threatened, or candidate species. Um, with the water quality, there will be a uh, best management practices will be outlined in the stormwater quality strategic plan. Uh, utilities and infrastructure, there's plenty uh, uh, available for the project and it complies with the Hawaii advised, uh, Hawaii administrative rules as well as the um, SMA, HRS and ROH. Uh, finally, we don't expect that the um, improvements to the park will have any um, effects to the coastal recreation area. Um, water quality will be um, uh, taken care of with best management practices as well as um, the on-site um, wastewater, uh, liquid waste that they, uh, infrastructure that they have. And um, we don't expect that views from Kalani and Ole, Ole Highway will be affected. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Ms. Natal. Uh, members, any questions for the agent? Okay, Council Member Kiaina. Uh, thank you. I uh, maybe I do have a question probably for the general manager would be better to ask, but let me just ask you about the footprint. I understand you guys not are not going beyond the boundary, but um, as a follow-up to the briefing you guys gave me, I know that, so thank you for this. I care about what the increase of the um, improvements are, and it's 50, nearly 50,000 square feet, 47,856. And so thank you for um, providing this because if from your original one, I would have no idea. You just say what the amount is and on the map it shows like improvements, but 
the Ocean Oddities Indoor Aquarium is completely new, right? That's 15,400 square feet. And the Kaupo Village is going to be increased to 4, 14,620. I, I just have to ask a question because that's a lot, right? And uh, the fact that these are public lands, I just care because uh, these are lands for the public. And it just so happens that Oceanic Institute has a lease and they're subleasing out to you. So I just want to better understand, do you, uh, are you just, uh, for the ocean, uh, this aquarium is just an added feature for the park? Is that why you need that? I think uh, we're going to have Valerie King address the purpose of the Ocean Oddities Aquarium. It's an important component. Uh, yes, it is. Um, thank you very much for that question. Uh, it is, uh, we're hoping to upgrade the park, so we would like to add a, an aquarium. Currently, that land is being used for backstage facilities, so we do have pools there. Okay. and other holding tanks for animals. So it's not undeveloped. We want to repurpose it, and it would be a new building. Okay. And a um, uh, significant improvement, right? Yes, it uh, would With be. regard to the aquarium size, and I'm assuming that it would probably be a major attraction to the overall activities that you provide for we visitors. We believe it would Is that be. correct? Yes, that's okay, correct. I'm just trying to better understand this. Yes. And the Cowpool Village, I know we talked about it a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I know what's kind of there now. It seems like there's a lot of buildings. Uh, uh, what are they all going to be utilized uh, uh, for, and is uh, is that necessary? Well, they're actually holly, so you know it is re permits are required because uh, it has to have a concrete base. But it is going to well, be you mean like holly, a recreation. You mean, uh, there's holly can be a house. <laughs> so yeah, well, it's a recreation holly? of a fishing village. Okay, okay. Yeah, so that was uh, the intent there on the Luau grounds. And it is not really utilized in the day. Yeah. So we felt that it would be nice to put Holly around so that it could be open for visitors to walk through and learn about okay, the fishing so village that was there. I got, so I want to make sure because there's a lot of buildings here. So yeah. it's uh, the traditional Holly. Correct. Right? Correct. So uh, thatched roof with Correct. The, okay. 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 Um, Thank you for that. Okay. Um, and then just last uh, about the leases, can I better understand this? Um, for Oceanic Institute, uh, are they a, um, does DLNR, uh, their lease rent for them, are they considered a, uh, it's part of HPU, right? Hawaii Public University. Uh, That's correct. It's owned by and so HPU. Do they get a different rate? Are they being charged a commercial rate for this uh, overall lease? Uh, I believe they are. I'm okay, and then I guess I'm trying to better understand this. They are not making money off of you in their sublease, are they? Are, are, is it within the confines of the overall master lease that you're being charged a percentage as opposed to they being given the lease and then they're uh, increasing your sublease rent to rent from them? Um, uh, do you understand? I'm, sorry, I'm just trying to understand. They, they are charged a lease rent from DLNR. Correct. Are they making money off of your sublease or, or, or are they charging you within the confines of a percentage over the overall lease rent? Uh, we do pay uh, a minimum lease rent to them as well as a percentage of our revenue. To? Whether or not to Oceanic HPU. Yes, correct. Oh my God. I'm sorry, I, they shouldn't uh, be making money. This is public land. They shouldn't be making money off of a sublease rent. They're being charged by deal on R. So anyway, that's something I'll, uh, I'm actually interested in when you guys go for the, uh, when HBU does it. And then um, did a deal on R in the calculation for the overall rent to Oceanic Institute, they, did they factor you in that overall lease rent or did they not, meaning the, you're present clearly mm -hmm. on the um, property. Um, I love your educational activities as well as what you provide for both Kama'aina and visitors as well as working with the community, but the fact is you still are a commercial activity. So I guess I'm wondering when DLNR uh, charges HPU, do they factor in 
uh, your activities uh, in the overall lease rent? I'm not, to be honest with you, I can't answer that. I'm not sure what the LNR agreement with OI is. Well, I have to tell Institute. you, I'm interested because, yeah. of course, uh, not it's not just uh, public lands, but of course, uh, Office sure. of Hawaiian Affairs gets a certain percentage of all the lease rent. Mm -hmm. And I just want to make sure that um, I guess I know the history so I could, if you can have, uh, I am interested. So yeah. if you could have uh, Oceanic Institute, uh, contact me. Oh, I'd I like will. to have a better understanding over over uh, their overall lease rent okay. uh, with um, DLNR. They should not be making money off of a sublease rent and having a percentage of your revenues go to them. Uh, they don't have the land to make money. They have a land to serve their purpose, right? And I just want to make sure that uh, we hold uh, DLNR accountable in the manner of how they are leasing this property and that, um, that everyone is being treated fairly. I understand. Including the general sure. public. But um, I'm excited for your project and I uh, appreciate your team explaining uh, the uh, concerns by the community and you guys being conscious of that. And, and that's the most I can uh, ask with regard to um, community impacts. And the uh, Limo Hui uh, is very active. I'm uh, very excited about that program and I'm glad that they have a presence on your property. Thank you. Did you need to add something? No thanks, no thanks. Unless you have further questions. I no, 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 uh, but I would like to uh, have a better understanding of the lease rent with the Oceanic Institute for this property. Thank you, we'll have that information for you. Or you can have them contact me directly, either way. Mr. Overton, Jeff, my recommendation as a chair is that please contact DLNR, the Division of Land Management, Mr. Russell Suji. They do the contracts on leases, state lands. So the actual lease is held by Oceanic Institute. I believe they would have to make that contact as the direct leaseholder. We can inquire with OI on that relationship, but we, uh, Sea Life Park does not have that direct relationship with DLNR. No, no, all I'm requesting is that you could make a request to just get the lease agreements between. Oh, get the lease agreement. Okay. And then I believe in the provisions of the lease agreement, the state always takes a percentage of the sublease also. Correct. And that is to benefit the 20% uh, seated land revenues. That, that's correct, Chair. And I think uh, one thing to consider is I don't understand why you don't have your own uh, lease agreement with DLNR, especially with the renegotiations, renegotiations coming up. You don't need to go through a, uh, another party. Uh, you've been there for a long time. You're very well respected. And in my view, if the lease is coming up, uh, it would be in everyone's interest to make it cleaner for DLNR to have a separate lease for Oceanic Institute for their activities and a separate lease with Sea Life Park. And uh, we work with uh, DLNR very closely, so I might uh, uh, mention it as well to them. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to mention that I, I believe that uh, HPU's lease with uh, DLNR is for about another 45 years. So I, I'm not sure, you know, what the, how that can be <laughs> changed prior to that. I believe, Ms. King, it's not what the Vice Chair Kiana is asking, it's just to determine what is the general lease rent between Oceanic Institute or HPU and then the sublease. When you go into the sublease of a state con uh, lease agreement, there is a provision in the contract to say that whichever is greater, the state will have some of that increase in the rent that they charge you folks. Okay. Any further discussions for the agent, please? If not, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Now we have uh, Director Apuna. Department of Planning and Permitting. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the department um, is supportive of the proposed CD1 for this pro project, or this SMA. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for the director? Okay, that was quick. Thank you very much. 
At this point in time, members, we will now proceed on with remote testimony. Madam Clerk, do we have any testifiers? Okay. Yes, okay, Mr. Paul Nattingal. Nat Please, Paul. You may proceed. Uh, good morning, Committee Chair Say and distinguished council members and Director Apuna and Ms. Kruger. I am Professor Paul Noctegal, and I'm here to speak in favor of Resolution 22293. I'm a biologist, psychologist, and environmentalist. I'm the founding director and now research professor emeritus at the Marine Mammal Research Program at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology, University of Hawaii at Manoa on Coconut Island. Mm -hmm. I'm in strong support of Resolution 22293. When it became necessary to close my whale and dolphin lab on Coconut Island, all my animals thankfully were transferred to Sea Life Park. I was allowed to continue research without charge at Sea Life Park as I was able and the animals, all of whom were born in captivity except my old false killer whale, continued to have excellent care with full-time caretakers, veterinarian, excellent food, and people that truly cared for them. Sea Life Park provides a place where our children can see dolphins up close and in person. This is far superior to asking our families to go out and visit and illegally disturb the local Hawaiian spinner dolphins that come into bays to rest during the day after spending the entire night fishing. Sea Life Park is a very popular spot for our local residents as well as others that visit. My experience is that it takes a very large amount of money to keep dolphins and whales well cared for. Sea Life Park is historic and getting old and needs a facelift. This resolution allows for vast improvements to the park and for habitats of the fish, sea lions, and lovebirds, and will make the whole place much more attractive to everyone. A more attractive place will bring in more funds to better care for the animals. A better take at the gate will also help the windward Waimanalo economy. The overall populations of wild cetaceans have benefited and continue to benefit from excellent basic research conducted in captive commercial situations like Sea Life Park. Mr. Nadengal, can you summarize your testimony? I'm almost finished. Okay, and great. I'm invited to their guests when they visit. Please pass this resolution to improve Sea Life Park to benefit both our local keiki and the populations of both Sea Life Park animals and their wild conspecifics. Thank you very much. Members, any questions for Professor Nadengal? Thank you very much for your eloquent presentation and testimony in support of the resolution. Hello. Thank you. Okay. Members, at this time, we have a phone call testifier and is 808-018. Are you there? And, oh, I'm sorry, and I wanted to ask you, which agenda item are you testifying on? Chair, say, this is Kathy Mitchell with the Board of Water Supply. I'm, I'm going to testify on the next resolution following this one. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you. Madam Clerk, are there any in-person testimony? Oh, one more. Oh, we have... Remote testimony, Ms. Gigi Zhang. Angela, good morning. Good morning, Chair. Angela testifying on behalf of CARES. Um, so in our research, I called Sea Life Park and the operator told me Sea Life Park is a for-profit entity and is not a nonprofit. Um, but I don't know if that information is correct or not um, because I didn't verify with like the management level. Um, so let's say if the operator is correct um, and it operates as an animal conservatory and a marine life protection site, but it is also a commercial business, um, right? So Sea Life Park are, operates a little differently. Um, and so there are some discrepancies because it is such a unique entity. Um, and um, so... What I was gonna um, say in support of um, Sea Life Park is that um, the, um, the park 
runs three conservation programs, the Green Sea Turtle Program, the Native Seabirds Program, and the Hawaiian Monk Seal Program. Um, and some of those programs will be receiving um, renovations. Um, the Sea Life Park hosts the Seabird Rehabilitation Facility and it heals native birds. The federally protected wedge-tailed and new wells shearwater chicks are partic particularly vulnerable during breeding season, and the park assists with hundreds of the native birds. Um, and there has been over 16,000 turtles that have been released from the park. Um, the Hawaii Hawaiian green sea turtles are one of the few species of turtles in the world that have seen numbers rise in recent decades because of raising awareness and conservation efforts. Turtles are not endangered. Ms. Young, can anymore. you summarize Thank your you. testimony in support yes. of the resolution? I support the resolution in conclusion. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much for your testimony. Members, any questions for Ms. Young? Madam Clerk, are there any further remote testify? Uh, Chair, there are none. Okay. Are there any in-person testimony? Chair, there are none. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Members, we are in discussion in regards to Resolution 22-293. So if there is no discussion, can we move on? That the Chair would like to recommend that Resolution 22-293 be amended to the posted Committee Draft 1. Everybody has a copy of the Committee Draft 1. And let me state it for the record for the general public at large. For A, this is, these are the amendments. It revises condition C.2 to delete the phrase beach, sandalwood, and others. B adds a new condition C.3 that provides that the construction permit plans must show that the new entry consigliere and gift shop roof has a earth toned natural brown color. C adds a new section G that provides that if the new entry consigliere and gift shop building is found to have visual impacts to the surrounding area, the applicant shall mitigate those impacts and re-letter subsequent conditions accordingly. D updates re-lettered condition I to the standard language used in the special management area use permit resolution. And E will make miscellaneous technical and non-substantive amendments. <clears throat> or is there any discussion for the committee draft one? Objections or reservations? Hearing none, the resolution has been amended to a committee draft one. The chair then recommends that resolution 22-293, committee draft one, be reported out for adoption. Any discussion, objections, or reservations? Hearing none, so ordered. Congratulations and best wishes, Ms. King, on your new project. Okay, let's move on to agenda number six, resolution 23-11. Before we begin, as a former speak, uh, teacher, what ROH are we addressing now? Count Freshman Wire. Resolution 23-11. I know this is a 201H project, state you law. You got it. Yeah. Now you can remember all of this, okay. Mahalo, well, Chair. Okay, this resolution authorizes exemptions from certain requirements pursuant to chapter 201H-38, Hawaii revised statutes relating to the development of the Fort Street Mall affordable senior rental housing project on a 6,900 square foot size zone BMX 4, which is a central business mixed use district, located at 1155 Fort Street Mall and at 1159 Fort Street Mall in Honolulu, and identified as tax map keys 2 1 010 33 and 034. Members, we have a proposed CD1 version or a committee draft version of the resolution listed on the agenda addendum. For your information, a summary of the amendments is listed on the agenda addendum. Members, we have also distributed a proposed further amendment to the committee draft one version of the resolution. 
which would revise condition B4 and the fifth B further resolve clause. Amendments to the condition B4 would make the loading management plan a part of the traffic management plan and provide that the traffic management plan must include the service lane and the drop off and pickup area and be based on the data from the updated traffic assessment. It would also provide that the project's ground floor design must ensure that the layout of the project's turnaround area will allow all users of the service lane to safely turn around and exit without having to reverse out of the service lane onto Bishop Street. Amendments to the fifth bid further resolve clause regarding conformity with the project's preliminary plans and specification would provide an exception to comply with condition B4. Joining us in the council chamber, we have Mr. Isaiah T Sato from RM Tao Corporation, the applicant's agent to give a brief presentation of the project to the committee. For your information, the presentation is available online as miscellaneous communication 54 of 20. 23. Okay, Mr. Isaiah Sato. Hello, Chair Se. Thank you everyone for allowing us to present today. Thank you members of the City Council and Council Chair Se. I'm here to present on Resolution 23-11. One second. Okay. Thank you. So I'm going to be walking through our presentation today. So we're proposing the Fort Street Mall Affordable Senior Rental Housing Project. So we're really excited to present this project. My name is Isaiah Sato from RM Tao Corporation. I have members of our team here. I have David Tanoi from RM Tao. I have Mike Magaoi from the um, owner and applicant. And I have Christine Camp from Avalon Group, who is also here to help answer any questions as they may come up. So this first slide, we go over that our applicant is Catholic Charities Housing Development Corporation, and we're proposing to develop a 17-story affordable housing, affordable senior rental housing building. So there's going to be 67 units total. 66 of the units will be affordable senior rentals, limited at 30% AMI or a maximum of 60% AMI. And that one remaining unit is going to be a manager's unit. We're also proposing around 17,000 square feet of program and administrative uses on the first three floors of the building. These um, spaces will be for the Catholic Church. And we're going through the city's DPP 201H application process there. I'm going to call Mike up to present on Catholic Charities. Thank you, Isaiah. Uh, good morning, uh, Council Chair uh, Tse and uh, Council members, Tommy, and also the resident members. Uh, my name is Michael Mago. I am the uh, president of Catholic Charities Housing Development Corporation. Catholic Charities has been around for many years. It started with, uh, in 1947 with the Marinol Sisters. And today we have been grown to be one of the largest uh, caregiver uh, as far as nonprofit in Hawaii. Uh, let, within the last uh, couple of years with the pandemic, uh, we were major uh, resources for the, the city and county of Honolulu and also state in providing uh, a rental relief for all the different organizations. And basically for our mission is to help the people in need. And what we do is we do a lot of self-esteem to help them to get it to another place. But the question is, when we help them, what is the next step? So for us, was we created uh, Catholic Charity Housing Development Corporation back in 1970, back in 1998, because we want to give these uh, people that we're helping a place to make a living, a place to get big steam, to live out their years as seniors. So with the Catholic Charities development, uh, we started uh, some project 13 years ago. Our first project is the uh, Mayhola Vista. It's a uh, Milani Maka. Uh, it's, uh, we're on the last phase right now. It's, uh, the total build out would be about 300 single bedroom units and with uh, parking. So it's, it's really blended in and a single bedroom. Also, we're also in Maui. We've just completed uh, Kahulu Lani 1 and 2. Each of the buildings are about 98 units, single bedroom, and it's right next to Kahomanu Shopping Center. And also on Maui, uh, we're looking at uh, Holly Polina. You know, basically on Maui, we had a tremendous support from 
the former mayor Victor Reno and to basically to set up uh, housing on their, their island. And also there's other mayors on the other county want us to take a look, but first of all, we need to take a look what is the need on Oahu. And uh, um, basically we're here to ask for your consideration for our Forest Street Mall project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. So this next slide, we show our project site. So there's two maps. The one on the left side is a little more zoomed out, and the one on the right side is more zoomed in. But if you look at the right map, that street going diagonal is Bishop Street. So that's the main street in the area. And perpendicular to that, above it in this image, is Fort Street Mall. So our project is um, right between Fort Street Mall and Bishop Street, right along Fort Street Mall itself. So we're, we're very close to Hawaii Theater, um, Kukui Plaza, and you know, really the core of downtown Honolulu there. This next slide shows our project site on the left side. To, so to kind of orient yourself there, the, um, the red building is the existing two-story building, and right in the front of that is the Fort Street Mall there. On the left side in this image, it would, it's the Catholic Church. Um, behind our building, that taller um, gray building is the Finance Factors building, and a little bit more to the right is the 1132 Bishop Project, which is a similar project. It's converting um, their office spaces to residential or affordable residential there, too. So our lot area is fairly tight. It's 6,900 square feet, and the zoning there is BMX for business mixed use, and the height limit for the lot is 400 feet. This next slide shows the existing site, the existing building. So this is standing on Fort Street Mall facing the Bishop Street side. It's an existing two-story building um, that was previously used for a number of uses, commercial and, and office, and currently it's a vacant building. So we intend to demolish this building to reconstruct our new building there. This slide shows a project overview. So just starting from the bottom up, the first three levels in purple are dedicated for program and administrative uses. So this is going to be for the Roman Catholic Church there. And above that on level four is going to be a recreational deck area, a resident manager's unit, as well as one affordable rental unit. And the remaining levels five through 17 are going to be purely senior rental housing units there. This slide is a ground floor plan, so kind of to orient yourself first, on the left side of this screen is Fort Street Mall, and on the right side of this screen, this screen excuse me, is the service lane. So if we start at the bottom middle, we have a lobby area here. So our main entrance would be on Fort Street Mall for the pedestrians, but we also have an access um, walkway that connects to the service lane in the back. In the upper left corner is an area that, um, for the Catholic Church for their program and admin uses there. So we um, hope to have nice open um, clear windows there that we can really activate this space on Fort Street Mall as our main project pedestrian frontage there. And the upper right of this slide, we have a lot of our utility areas. So the emergency generator room, the HECO room, the trash room, and the other rooms that we really needed to have on the first floor there. This slide shows levels two and three, and these will be two levels that will be for the Catholic Church. And the interior design hasn't been completely configured yet, but um, we're working closely with them there. Level four, um, starting from the left side, which is again Fort Street Mall side, we're going to have a outdoor recreation deck area, and we're also including 16 bicycle stalls for our senior residents. Um, that first room on the left is a multi-purpose room that will also be for our residents. In the middle of this image is the resident manager's unit, and all the way on the far right is one affordable rental unit there. This next slide is a typical floor plan for levels 5 through 17. So again, Fort Street Mall would be on the left, um, the Mackay side would be below, and the service lane would be on the right. But we have five units per floor for a total of um, 66 units there. 65 units and then one more on the fourth floor. So what I wanted to highlight in here too is we as you can see in the left on the upper portion, we are having windows, operable windows that will be facing the Malka direction there. So those will be able to open for our senior residents there. We're showing um, one bedroom plans here um, in the typical layout. And the units are about 16 feet wide. This next rendering shows 
the massing of the building and the scale in comparison to kind of the vicinity around it. So that um, rectangular area or building is shows the general shape and size of our building. And as you can see, we're just under 200 feet. We're about 190 feet. So we kind of fit right in the right in the you know the area and kind of fit in with the buildings in the vicinity. This slide shows a rendering from Fort Street Mall. If you're standing on the mall, going in the Makai, looking in the Makai direction there. So again, we have all the operable windows facing the Malka direction. On the back side, we have a structural wall. So I wanted to spend a few minutes to talk about the service access and loading. So to get oriented on the right image, our project site is that red um, square kind of in the middle. Again, Fort Street Mall is right um, next to us on the EVA end. And on the um, east side, it would be Bishop Street. So to access our site, we, we're going to be utilizing a service lane that is comprised of existing easements for the various landowners. Um, that share that usage. So the access to that e service lane is off Bishop Street, and that would um, access the back end of our lot there. So um, through our application, we aren't providing any parking stalls, and we're asking for an exemption from the loading stall. So we intend to utilize um, this service lane there too. And to so. This next slide also shows the service lane um, a little more zoomed in. Um, on the left side is Fort Street Mall, the red is the Chaplin Lane, um, and on the right side, the green would be the easement. So 10 feet of that easement is actually within our lot, so that easement is for our neighbors, and um, the remainder of the service lane is in the neighbor's property there. So this slide has a lot of information. On the left side is our project site data. The right side is our building data. So we are in the state land use urban district. We are not within a special district. We are not within the SMA. We are within the downtown neighborhood TOD. So we would anticipate to be in the TOD special district once that um, goes through. We're in flood zone X, and we're in the safe tsunami zone there. The proposed building, um, we're requesting 10.0 FAR. Um, a height of 173 feet with mechanical equipment on top, zero parking stalls, no loading stalls, and to utilize the service access, as well as 16 um, bicycle stalls on the fourth floor. This next slide highlights our exemptions for the project. The far left is the standard, the middle is the requirement, and the right is what we're proposing or there. So for density, the lot would typically have 4.0 maximum. We're requesting a 10.0 FAR. The front yard, we're requesting to provide zero front yard area, zero loading stalls. Um, we're proposing to provide 16 bicycle stalls um, for the seniors there right below park dedication. So we're requ requesting exemption from the park dedication requirement for the affordable senior rental units there. Um, we are providing about 1,000 square feet of park space on that fourth floor. So we're requesting exemption from the remainder. Um, the next item is we're um, requesting an exemption from various permit review and utility fees. Um, our understanding was that water, we're requesting a deferral of the fees until certificate of occupancy or until the water meter is installed there later. We're also asking for an exemption on the height setback and lighting and ventilation. And I have two more slides for that. This next one is the height setback exemption requirement. On the left is the LUO land use ordinance requirement there. So what this does is it says in the adjacent street, you go to the middle of the street and up at a 65 degree angle. And that creates the top border of your building envelope there. But that's only the top border for 50% of your street frontage. So what that essentially means on the right side for our project site is that area in maroon or magenta would exceed um, the height setback or would encroach into the height setback. So we're requesting an exemption from that. So the center line of the street that was, was used was the service lane on the backside of the project. Our last exemption, we're requesting an exemption from the housing code, the natural lighting and um, ventilation requirements. So we're requesting to provide artificial lighting and mechanical ventilation in the one bedroom, in the bedroom, excuse me, in accordance with the international building code there. 
So this would allow us to have enclosed bedrooms um, with sliding doors for our senior residents to kind of separate the living room area and the bedroom area there. And that's the last slide. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sato. Members, any questions for the applicant? No questions? OK. Department of Planning and Permitting. Thank you, Chair. So the department is um, OK with the proposed CD1. Um, as far as the service lane, though, we, we want to you know state for the record that it's important that the applicant provide a good plan that addresses accessibility um, and it is a safety issue. Um, so we will expect, you know, the plans that they come up with will be reviewed by our traffic uh, review branch um, for sufficiency in that area. But um, otherwise, the project is a good affordable housing project um, that we support in that respect. And I'm available for any questions. Okay. Thank you. Members, any questions for Director Apuna? Okay, Council yep. Member. Thank you, Director. Um, anticipating a, a longer discussion about the service lane as well as the uh, loading, not only for you know the necessary residential activities, but also for passenger pickup. Um, I note that uh, 1525 which establishes pedestrian malls and the uses along Fort Street indicate that uh, passenger loading is allowed for the Catholic Church, which is next door to this project, as well as for the Blaisdell Hotel, which is a little bit Mackay. And so passenger activities seemingly are allowed to some limited extent on Fort Street Mall. But your, your department is recommending uh, that Fort Street Mall not be allowed to be used for passenger loading, which would force uh, residents of here, or perhaps visitors, to only utilize Chaplin Lane for pickup or drop off or the service lane behind. Mm -hmm. why, why is the department okay with allowing the Catholic Church to do pick up and drop off along Fort, within Fort Street Mall or the Blaisdell Hotel, but not for the residents here? And what's the difference, what's the difference between if these residents went next door to the church, did a Hail Mary, and said they're here for the church and could be picked up at the church instead of in front of this uh, affordable housing project. Thank you for the question, council members. So generally, I don't think we allow, um, you know, vehicle access um, on Fort Street Mall. As far as, you know, specifically to the Catholic Church or other properties that are allowed to, I have staff here that might be able to speak to that. But yeah, we wouldn't, um, we don't, we've talked to the applicant and we're not allowing that type of access. Um, along Fort Street Mall. So Michael Catt is our staff planner and he can provide more details. Michael Catt, DPP. Uh, so for the uh, Catholic Church, that exemption um, is allowed because uh, they essentially uh, don't have access uh, to uh, a loading zone. And that, that exemption is really to allow for uh, services to the church. So think uh, weddings and funeral processions for them to, you know, load uh, on the mall uh, briefly and then exit. Uh, and then for the, the area across uh, from the proposed uh, project, they're allowed uh, to load onto Fort Street Mall because they don't have a service lane. Uh, the uh, layout of uh, that uh, section of downtown, the service lane that would be there has been built up. So they uh, have this exemption to uh, accommodate those uh, store franges that would otherwise have to uh, load from Bethel and then <laughs> walk all their stuff uh, to Fort Street. So the applicant is uh, proposing or saying that the, their traffic assessment will have six to nine trips an hour. And so we felt that that uh, would impose uh, a safety risk for the, you know, the users of uh, Fort Street Mall and defeats the intent of it being a pedestrian you know, area.
Okay, any further discussion for Mr. Michael Katz? I think from Mr. Katz, the biggest, no, I have a question. For all of us, the biggest issue that's confronting the council is the issue of the loading zone and the access of Fort Street Mall. With the language that is proposed as part of the further amendment be suffice to address this issue? Yes, uh, how it's uh, been per, uh, revised and uh, now yes. proposed, uh, it, would, it would cover that. Okay, and for Mr. Sato, your thoughts on this particular proposed uh, amendment that is before the council also? May I read it to all of you? Okay, yes. Indian public. In trying to determine what would be a very good compromise, you know, we came up with the B, which is prior issuance to any building permit for the project. All we're asking the applicant shall submit to DPP for its review and approval. That the traffic master plan must include the service lane and drop off and pick up area and based on data from the updated traffic assessment. Show how two-way traffic will be accommodated. Explain how pedestrian safety measures will be addressed and demonstrate where and how refuse trucks are gonna be handled. The handy van, service, delivery vehicles, and other vehicles will perform drop off and pick up activities. The project's ground floor design must ensure that the layout of the project's turnaround area will allow all users of the service lane to safely turn around and exit without having to reverse out of the service lane onto Bishop Street. So is it gonna go right around rather than reversing out back on Bishop? And then to make it palatable, I thought this would be it. The fit bid resolve clause is revised to read in its entirety as follows. Be it further resolved that except to comply with condition B4, the final plans and specifications for the project constitute the zoning building and construction standards for the project and are approved if those plans and specifications do not substantially deviate from the plans and specifications submitted to the council, provided that minor modifications to the design character or specifications of the building or landscaping may be approved by the DPP if such modifications are consistent with the prevailing neighborhood character. Mr. Sato, your thoughts on this proposed? Yes, please state your name. Uh, thank you, uh, Committee Chair Save. My name is Christine Camp, Avalon Development. We're the development partner for this project. And um, what I wanted to express is that thank you for that thoughtful uh, issue related to the shared um, loading zone. Can you go back to the plan where it shows Chaplain Lane? Um, I mean, yeah, so if I may, I believe that it's safer for pedestrians to be dropped off at Chaplin Lane if we can't be dropped off in front of um, 4th Street Mall. Because if you look at the distance of 4th Street Malls, which is a pedestrian access, relative to being dropped off at the um, service lane, it's safer for them to cross a pedestrian access rather than in, in an area where it's loading and unloading. That's an active loading and unloading area. So um, I would would ask um, this committee's consideration to allow for loading and um, loading of pedestrians, pick up for pedestrians, actually at Chaplin Lane, which is currently happening anyway, and it's a public access way. Um, second, on the handy van, um, you know, handy vans pick up um, right by bus stops. Bishop Street has a, um, a handy, you know, a bus stop. There are many handy van drop-offs uh, happening now on Bishop Street, as well as Baratania Street, and maybe even Chaplin Lane. That is what we're going to suggest for your consideration. I understand that, uh, you know, that it's been very thoughtful, but I, I believe that distance will be more appropriate for pedestrian drop-off, which is what we would like to suggest for our loading management plan um, as, as part of our program. I'm concerned that if you don't express it in your CD1 here, that DPP may not allow us to unload at Chaplin Lane. And so that could be part of our management programs, if you could include that. Um, and, and, and second is handy van drop off um, and, and access, um, recognizing that also handy van, you know, does their drop offs in other areas. If you consider all of the um, Bishop Street and Hotel Street, 
there, it's not accessible to cars, but it's accessible to buses. I believe Handyvan is also accessible. They can use that um, hotel street where uh, otherwise others are not. So our, rec our request is if you allow, if you allow for the Handyvan access to be done offsite, not in this loading zone. That would also alleviate a lot of the issues related to the loading management plan that we will, will proceed with. And last item, as um, you may know or may not be aware that this is a project from 30% to 60%, which means funding will be for, uh, through LIHTC. And low-income tax credits um, are governed by IRS and that there's a specific definite spend down time frame. And what I'm concerned about is if we're addressing issues with neighbors who may or may not be happy about sharing an access way that has not been utilized by this property since it's not been used for the last 10 years or so, that it may take a, a long time to get to an agreement with the neighbors. And so I'm wondering if you would allow us to go through the building permit process, but that making sure that this loading management plan is accepted before occupancy. And what that, that does for us is to allow us to preserve any low-income tax credit opportunities that require certain spend down within a certain time frame. Um, so those are some of the comments that I have to your draft for your consideration today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> maybe for Director Apuna. You know, publicly stating for the record, has there, it, has there been any precedent set in the past of granting a permit based upon you know, the approval of DPP? What I'm getting at, they're asking that we approve this resolution on the premise that you folks will have to make that decision, or shall we just defer and wait? My position is to come up with some language to accommodate both parties, but leaving it to you folks on the premise that you folks are gonna be doing it within a year's time, based on what Ms. Camp said in regards to the low income tax credits that they're applying for and they don't wanna lose it. I don't know. Well, I think that you know ultimately it's the um, committee's decision to move forward with the resolution or defer it. I think in both cases though, it's up to DPP to look at their plan for the um, access and turnaround, and we're gonna make that decision whether, you know, at the time that we receive their plan. So either way, we would make that decision, regardless if you um, do the resolution uh, now or defer to a later time. They only have 45 days. Oh, and they only have 45 days. <coughs> or it's deemed approved. Liz, Liz, did you have any comments um, so you'd like to make? So there's no time to defer. Oh yeah, we have to either go up or down. <coughs> but I'm happy, council member. <coughs> yeah, and so I think to further expand on this, you know, the the condition says prior to issuance of any building permit for the project, the applicant shall submit to the DPP for its review and approval. So does this seem to imply that? the TMP and the loading management plan has to be approved by DPP and then the building permit is issued or simply is it that the applicant shall submit and then DPP does its thing. Um, is it simply submittal that's a trigger or is it approval that's a trigger? We would have to approve their plan in order to... So you have a very short time to uh, review and approve their plan. Um, and you know, I, I've been... <laughs> Uh, quite vocal on the issue of the uh, building permit delays, so I would hate to see a condition that delays um, building permits, you know, further and creates uh, more of a backlog. So the building permit doesn't need to be approved. Um, I mean, so this resolution to approve the 2NH would allow it to move forward. The building permit comes at a later time, but it does not. It wouldn't necessarily affect the funding that uh, Ms. Camp was speaking of. Okay. Um, I do have a second question, and this might actually be a DTS question, not a DPP question, but Chaplain Lane, if, if I recall correctly, um, it's th the signage and restrictions are for commercial loading only. Is that the case? And is it time-based in any way? What's the process to change that if we were to uh, realize that a passenger sh you know, should be dropped off in Chaplain Lane instead of on uh, the service lane. Do we have to make any changes? And if so, how do we make changes to Chaplain Lane? 
Michael Cat with DPP again. Uh, so it it would uh, require you know changes to that, but Chaplain Lane uh, falls under the the same um, uh, chapter that allows for those uh, commercial businesses along Fort Street Mall uh, to uh, load there. So they actually entered Chaplain Lane and then they. Uh, move down Fort Street Mall, and then they would exit, I believe it's uh, Puahi uh, Street, where they would uh, exit. So the Chaplin Lane is actually pretty narrow, so uh, to load from there uh, and then not enter Fort Street Mall would require you to reverse out onto B uh, Battle Street. Any further discussion, Council Member? The Santos, this is your area, so <clears throat> any further discussion, members? Chair Waters, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Director Apuna, please. Um, yeah. So it's not often that we see projects that are building at 30% AMI, and this, of course, is 30 to 60% AMI, so it's something that I think the council likes. But my concern is that, and I appreciate the effort um, Chair say that you put into condition B4. Yes. Um, so my question, a couple questions, is if we approve this today with B4 in there, but yet the applicant at some later point cannot comply with B4, does that then kill the project? Do you not issue the building permits? Potentially, that could happen. But I mean, I think we, we've met with the applicant, and we do think that there are probably options for them to, to create um, accessibility for the, for the service area. Um, so it's not impossible. I think that they have options, and we're not looking to kill the project, and we hope that um, they're able to come up with an acceptable plan. Okay, I mean, one of the things that concerns me is in sec the proposed section B4, second to the last line, that the project's turnaround error will allow all users of the service, and it says all, lane to safely turn around and exit without having to reverse. So I'm looking at page, well, the ground floor, Right, and you look where that lane would be, and just looking at the map, it's on the opposite side of the Fort Street Mall side. There's the emergency generator, HECO, and trash room. And I'm presuming in the trash room, you're gonna have one of those big roll-off type things where the forklift comes and grabs it and can back out, and the, the larger garbage truck could probably wait on, on I guess it would be Bishop Street, right? But you're gonna require these these trash trucks to be able to turn around. So if you think about it, these are like, looks like Ford F-350s with a forklift on it. When you have that can, garbage can on there, is 20 feet enough room for those garbage trucks to turn around? Because 4B requires that. I'm, I'm not sure about the specifics, but I think that if they have to, they might have to move utilities and use the, their footprint to allow that type of access. Um, I mean, I went, I went to the, the site last week, and it, it is very tight. There's a lot of traffic in that little lane. Um, but again, it's a matter of safety for people to maneuver, but also, you know, whether they're there's an emergency and fire trucks or other personnel that need to get in there, but I don't know, Michael. I mean, almost guaranteed a fire truck would not be able to turn around in that lane, right? I mean, I haven't been down there recently, but I'm very familiar with the area. Mm -hmm. um, are we requiring a fire truck to be able to turn well, around? Michael um, can speak more about that, yeah. Michael Cat with DPP again. Uh, to answer, it, it's not so much that uh, one truck would be the issue with uh, condition B4. It's that if there was multiple uh, trucks trying to get down that service lane. So part of uh, what that uh, revision to con that condition is addressing is that uh, the information that's found 
in the updated uh, traffic assessment is incorporated into the final design because uh, the service lane uh, right now can accommodate the loading that it has. It has, you know, uh, enough room for a vehicle to uh, maneuver uh, in it. The issue is that if we are now having six to nine trips based off the current TA, uh, which is not accounting for the adjacent users and the 17,000 square feet of office space, um, that's a lot of you know potential traffic that is going down that service lane. So what we're trying to ensure is that that loading management plan is accounting for uh, all, multiple vehicles potentially uh, having to use that service lane at uh, the same time. That way, um, if one vehicle is you know loading, another one you know isn't queued and then having to back up for them onto Bishop Street to allow them to pass. Because there are parts of the service lane that are, are narrow, it would make it probably difficult for one of those you know, tra uh, trash uh, pickups to you know, get by. Um, but there are, there are other strategies that they could, you know, uh, they could use to uh, make sure that the number of trips generated is lower. So they could work with the adjacent properties to come up with a schedule as to how um, uh, loading will be done. Like they'll have, you know, uh, their trash coordinated with, you know, uh, the, the bankruptcy court or uh, finance factor so that they're. No, that makes total sense. That that's something that you can plan for and create a schedule and schedule your deliveries at certain times of the day and the week. But again, if you look at 4B, it, it says that. The project turnaround error will allow all users of the service lane to safely turn around. I mean, I'm being a lawyer here, right? And then looking at it like literally what this says. They have to turn around and exit without having to reverse out of the service lane. So what you're saying is great. You can you can deal with the amount of vehicles coming in and out based on a service plan. But if we're requiring them to, to turn around is that is that the is that the what might kill this project that requirement i mean that maybe that's again you folks are the ones who are going to be issuing the permit yeah our traffic engineers are confident that a solution could be found because um the service lane is a private easement. It functions similar to a driveway, so there's a little bit more flexibility in terms of that maneuverability. It's a T shape, so they could turn down towards uh, the bankruptcy court and then reverse down towards the service lane uh, and then uh, be able to pull forward uh, and then exit you know, uh, onto Bishop correctly. So there. The maneuverability is there. It is more of a, the number of users of that service lane. And so if the TA discovers that there's going to be more than six to nine trips generated an hour, figuring out strategies to uh, reduce that further or come up with a way to ensure that we're not having uh, cars uh, queue on Bishop or uh, creating traffic congestion in that area. You know that that's what we're looking for. We and just as a uh, once the building is built, there's only so much room then that that uh, can be uh, provided for maneuverability. So that's why that extra part is included. Okay, I, I see what you're talking about. That T area. Um, I'm looking at slide 17, the one with that looks. Yeah, there you go. Same one. So, just out of curiosity. So you see the subject building is in red. And then just to the right of that, I presume that's the church property. If you go just below that, on the corner of Bishop and Baratania Street, there's another building there. There looks to be room from Baratania Street between those two buildings 
that you can perhaps enter that the service lane. I'm just curious as who owns that property and the church does. I mean that's also another possibility, right? That that if you really need to get in there you could possibly go through the church property on that side. Is that okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Council Member Wire. Thank you, Chair. I mean, would it be easier just to strike turnaround and, and then you just say safely exit without having to reverse onto the service lane onto Bishop Street? I don't know if that provides more options or if that's needed. Could you say it one more time? Um, so if we just strict turnaround and, and so it just said safely exit without having to reverse out of the service lane onto Bishop, it create more options, but just prevent the really what we're trying to avoid is having to reverse out. That could be okay. Yeah. 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 Because uh, we're just trying to ensure that you know people aren't having to back up <laughs> onto Bishop. And then it, yeah. Uh, there's just just a thought, Chair. Any further discussion, members, at this point in time? Uh, let's. You have something to say, please. Thank you, Chair. Elizabeth Krieger with the Land Use Permits Division. Uh, this is such an interesting conversation, and I'd like to broaden it out just for a moment for the council members to consider that there are a lot of buildings downtown that are looking at adaptive reuse, a lot of office buildings that are underutilized. We already saw that with 1132 Bishop. Now we're seeing this here on Fort Street. I think it's going to be really important to be looking at a holistic plan for downtown and how loading is going to occur. Um, we can't do that on this site-by-site -site basis necessarily, and um, like Chair is saying, we don't want to um, kill projects that are providing badly needed affordable housing. At the same time, we don't want to create so much congestion downtown that the livability is negatively impacted. So. Um, I definitely will be very excited to see your continued conversation about how uh, holistic loading plans for downtown will occur in the future. Thank you so much for the opportunity to say that. Thank you very much, Liz. Uh, Chair Waters, please. Thank you. Great, great point. So will you be coming to the Budget Committee with a request for funding for this comprehensive downtown plan? And if so, I mean, I think it's a good idea and perhaps the area council member should support something like that. When I started with the city, I was in the transportation planning branch at DTS and I would hate to uh, offer them up, but there were definitely very interesting uh, transportation type planning uh, things that they were doing at the time. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious, they perhaps have such a loading plan already. I would have to look into it. No, because I, I love the idea of revitalizing the area, um, Fort Street Mall. I mean, you look at European cities where they build around piazzas, like in Italy, where you have your, you know, your grocery store, your pharmacy, and you go right upstairs and and eateries and you can live right there. So I could see that in the future, assuming that, the, again, the Arab council member also sees that. Um, it, it might be something worthwhile to spend the money on. But thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Would the applicant like to respond to some of the council members' questions that we have just discussed, please? Thank you so much for these suggestions because um, if you really what we're asking for is if you would allow us to work on options that do have offsite opportunities and if we would allow DPP the flexibility to allow us to do that as part of this resolution, that would resolve some issues that we can work with the church. I think um, there's also a park that the city owns at the top of Fourth Street Mall um, that you know, has a, a lot of issues, right, with crime and loitering and what have you, that maybe we can revitalize uh, there and also use that as a pedestrian drop-off for handyman types of situations. So if you could, um, may I request your consideration to allow for off-site loading as part of this project, um, we would very much appreciate it, and it would help our project move forward. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Isaiah, please, because at this point in time, the chair would think that uh, the off-site off -site loading is not part of the overall process that we have discussed, or else that would have been brought up earlier in the uh, application. And that's why I bring it up for, but okay. please. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to say a few closing remarks. I mean, our team is really excited to bring this project, and I think a few people have touched upon revitalizing the downtown area, you know. So this lot is, I mean, it's currently a vacant use. We have issues with homeless people and with crime, you know, in Fort Street Mall. So we're, we're really excited to have our residents there, our resident managers living on site. We're going to have presence there 24-7 to hopefully um, really activate the frontage on Fort Street Mall there. Um, also, on the loading side, like you guys have mentioned, I mean, we do want to be good neighbors, and we have met with um, some of our the neighbors that use the, the service lane, and we want to continue to do that while we develop a management plan, like which Christine was mentioning, that maybe schedules our um, timing of our tenants moving in and out or, or otherwise. I mean, this usage as a residential usage will have significantly different hours than the typical commercial use. I mean, we, we anticipate more motion on the weekends when a lot of the downtown community is, is quiet. So we're, we're hoping to really schedule that and really um, work with that there too. And to add to um, what Christine was mentioning, um, I think we just want to ensure that the verbiage, if for whatever reason we are able or we have challenges finding the space on site or we're able to find some off-site loading areas that we have that flexibility um, to do that to, to meet the needs of our um, affordable renters there. So thank you. Okay. Any further discussion, members, at this point in time? If not, let's proceed on. <coughs> we'll, we will now take up remote testimony. Madam Clerk, are there any? Is Mr. Sterling Higa here? Remote testimony. Kathy Mitchell. Oh. I'm sorry, Chair, I'm here. Okay, go right ahead, Mr. Higa, thank you. Awesome, uh, thank you, Chair, Council Members. My name is Sterling Higa, testifying on behalf of Housing Hawaii's Future. We stand by our testimony in strong support of Resolution 23-11. I wanna highlight that every unit of housing built for our seniors frees up housing stock for the next generation. And adding density to the urban core is key to revitalizing the area. As someone who grew up a few blocks from the project site and worked two years for Hawaii Pacific University at its Fort Street Mall campus, I'm excited to see this project enhance the area. And just as an aside, I support allowing the use of Fort Street Mall for passenger pickup. The mall is more than wide enough to accommodate pedestrians on both sides of the middle lane, which would be used by vehicles. And a comparable example is Mililani Mall, which allows vehicle traffic to access the HGEA building. So please support Resolution 23-11, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much, Mr. Higa. Is there any questions for Mr. Higa? If not, may we proceed on to Ms. Kathy Mitchell of the Board of Water Supply. Kathy, are you there, Ms. Mitchell? If not, then we move on to Ms. Good morning. Oh. Good, good, no, good morning, Chair Say. Okay. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, please. Good morning, Chair Say uh, and Council Chair Waters and members of the committee. Uh, Kathy Mitchell with the Board of Water Supply. Uh, we support Resolution 2211, the proposed CD1, specifically Item 10. Uh, we're okay with the language. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Ms. Mitchell from the Board of Water Supply? Okay, M Madam Clerk, any more? Oh, Chair, you have one more. Okay. This is uh, Ms. Arlene DeCosta. No, for the... Uh... Oh, oh, Angela Young. Oh, I mean, yeah. Angela. Gigi Zhang. Hello, Chair. Um, Angela testifying on behalf of Kapalama NSW, um, providing comments. Um, we're just wondering what does the public safety assessment look like in regards to the 
housing project? Um, you know, um, do they work with the city's uh, prosecuting attorneys um, career criminal prosecution program? Because in a recent Senate public safety hearing, they mentioned crime in this specific area are committed by habitual criminals and where the proper term is career criminals. And if anyone has walked in the area, you can witness the criminals who live on that block um, just a few hundred feet from that site. Um, I pass this site every day and it's very likely that criminals will take advantage of seniors resulting in elder abuse and it's not safe. Um, that's why elder abuse is such a big thing um, and can result in a misdemeanor or a felony. Um, and elders are protected by state and federal law. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering about the public safety assessment for that. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Young. For that. Thank you. Madam Clerk, that's all for the remote testimony. Okay. Yes, Chair, there are none. Okay, let's move on to the in-person testifiers. At this point in time, we have Ms. Marlene DeCosta, Hello, um, uh, dear uh, Chair Say and Vice Chair, and all, all the honorable members. If I can just read my uh, testimony, I think it'd go by faster. Please fully support resolution 23-11, which would authorize exemptions for the Fort Street Mall Affordable Senior Rental 201H project being developed by Catholic Charities Hawaii Development Corporation. Uh, I'll use the initials going forward CCDHDC in, Hon in downtown Honolulu. This project has the support of the community with one exception, our adjacent neighbor, the owners of the office building known as Finance Factors. Um, the, we've heard earlier that the condition is about the alley, so let's, let, let me move on uh, further. Um, uh, in speaking with uh, CCHDC, they anticipate uh, developing the same cooperative a relationship that existed before, because these buildings have been around for for since the 1800s, well, 1900s, I guess. Um, and uh, as others have stated, trash removal can be coordinated uh, prior to the um, much in the same way that it is now. Uh, same thing with AC elevators, janitorial, all of that. Um, as a director of real estate for RCCH, the Roman Catholic Church, uh, we're well aware of the use of the easement area because we've owned buildings in that area. We've owned those two buildings um, since 2007 and 2010. And um, in summary, uh, RCCH is, is uh, continuing to cont contributing this land uh, to this affordable housing project in line with our strategic objectives um, and uh, continuing in the current strategic plan that we have, that we had in 2008 and currently. Um, our CCH uh, has a long history with finance factors because we're the ground lessor for 54.4% of the area that finance factors is situated. Uh, there's a rent reopening in 2014 that we have to work through and the ground re uh, ground lease terminates in 16 years in in um, in uh, 2039, at which time our CCH will be a joint owner of the property. So we need to be involved in these decisions, um, not only for the the what's currently how it's currently being used, but how it may be adapted, and if it if it is adapted by uh, finance factors to, let's say, another affordable user, just like 1132, we'd be in full support of them. In closing, RCCH contributed uh, under market land to Hope Services Hawaii, uh, which is operating on the Big Island of Hawaii, which in turn developed an affordable senior housing village, uh, fully supported by that county's administration and council. And we are hopeful that the city and council of Honolulu will do likewise for this affordable senior heart project pattern similarly. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Ms. DeCosta. Any questions for Ms. DeCosta from the Roman Catholic Church of Hawaii? If not, thank you very much. Next, we have uh, Ms. Laurie Lum. Oh, press the button. 
Good morning. Lori Lum on behalf of Russell Lau, Chairman and CEO of Finance Factors. Um, Finance Factors supports affordable senior rental housing in Honolulu. In fact, Russell is on the mainland this week working on bringing in affordable funds to, from the mainland to Hawaii. Um, due to the close proximity of Finance Factors Center to the proposed project, our comments in the testimony are really related to the concerns that you've already discussed. Um, pedestrian, motorist safety, access loading and circulation, similar to the, and consistent to the issues raised by the Department of Planning and Permitting. So we really do appreciate um, the discussion. We look forward to the opportunity of working with the developer. I would like to especially thank um, Chair Say and Vice Chair Dos Santos Tam for their time and efforts in this matter, and ask for your favorable consideration of DPP's recommendations and the further amendments being proposed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Lum. Any questions for the testifier? If not, let's proceed on to Ms. Heather Piper. Good morning, thank you. My name is Heather Piper. I'm the Executive Director of the Hawaii Community Reinvestment Corporation. We're a nonprofit that strongly supports the development of affordable housing in Hawaii, and we are here in support of this project. This project is extremely impactful, taking 6,900 square feet and building 66 affordable units for our kapuna and the most vulnerable kapuna, which are 60% below AMI and 30% below AMI. And we feel this project is extremely important and hope it moves forward and we're in support of it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Piper. Kenna Stormo Gibson. Aloha, Chair Say and Hi. Council Members. I just want to mahalo everyone for your hard work on getting the project to this point. And um, those deadlines and timelines on the tax credits are real. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm super happy to see everyone coming together. And um, the walkability of having senior housing where people can walk. I still remember the day I had to take the keys from my grandpa. Um, <laughs> and so just having projects like this in the downtown is an excellent thing for housing policy. Thank you. OK, any questions for Kenna? I have one, Kenna. Thank you very much for being part of the uh, Real Property Tax Advisory Commission. That's number one. And number two, can you explain to the members of the council, the zoning committee, in regards to what is low-income housing tax credit? Yes, it was a program designed um, under the Reagan administration in 1986, which says that um, housing projects that are affordable will be given funds from the federal government uh, through tax credits given to largely banks and institutions. So it's the major source of federal funding for all of the housing built since 1986. And um, as a result of, it's a very complicated scheme. It exists nowhere else in the world. <laughs> but the reality is that the federal government says, we will give money towards your projects. And it ends up being about 30% of the total money needed. right? So we will give money towards your projects if you follow this complicated set of rules. And in Hawaii, we um, give those credits out once a year, HHFDC does. And I think the county of Honolulu is working on its own potential program. But um, yeah, so it, it doesn't make funding affordable housing easy, but it's the program we have at this moment. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. It <laughs> OK, any other questions for Kenna? If not, may we proceed on to Ms. Stacy Eller. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. I just want to echo the comments that everybody else has made about affordable housing, and it's so important that we move forward with projects like this, so I'm testifying in strong support. Um, housing is so important, especially as cost of living, and so this is an extremely important project just because it is servicing um, low-income individuals from 30 to 60 percent AMI, which would give really needed like housing opportunities to um, elderly individuals who might otherwise end up on the street, which is what we're trying to avoid. So this is a really important project, and I just want to voice my support. Mahalo. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else here that want to testify in person at this point in time on Resolution 23-11? A 
Committee Draft 1. Good morning, Committee Chair Say and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Kevin Carney and I'm testifying on behalf of myself here in strong support of uh, this development, which is in the core of downtown Honolulu, close to services, close to transportation. And as you all know, affordable housing, both family and senior, is in great need, and particularly ones of this kind that are gonna serve those at 60% and below of the area median income. I encourage all of you to give it your full support and move this project forward as fast as you can. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Carney. Any questions for Mr. Carney? I hope you're not retired from EAH. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I am, as okay. of, as of August you. last year. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Is there anyone else wishing to testify in person? If there is no further discussion, me. Okay, at this point in time, members, we are in discussion. Your thoughts on resolution 23-11, committee draft one. Maybe I should start off as a chair yeah, of zoning. Uh, I think all of us here do support affordable housing, the 60% AMI and below. And uh, we also support our city agencies who have concerns about the public health and safety. Uh, all I can say is that uh, I did try to come up with some proposal draft as a compromise, Chair Waters, in seeing that this project move on. But uh, listening to the discussion, you know, there's still some differences, but I'll be open to what the members have in mind as far as your thoughts and, you know, Council Member Del Santos, this is your district, and I'll defer to you as far as what your thoughts are. But in the end, we'll, we all have to make that decision, the five of us. All right. Well, um, thank you for the opportunity to offer my thoughts. You know, we, we are in an incredible housing shortage, and in particular uh, for the, the lowest of um, income levels, um, that need is even greater, and also for seniors. And so a project like this that um, is very difficult to put together financing wise, um, you know, stands on its merits in terms of creating housing. You know, the issues uh, that, that are raised, um, you know, by uh, not only the, the adjacent property, but as Liz mentioned, this is part of an overall, you know, issue that we are going to face more and more in the downtown corridor. And I hope that there is more redevelopment, more activation of the downtown space. So over the next you know, year or so, I'd like to help work on this. Um, I was, I was appreciated hearing Chair Waters mention, um, you know, a, a desire to have a study here. Um, and the more activity we have in downtown, the more real property tax revenue we uh, generate, which hopefully will help pay for studies like this. But we do need to do it, um, not just on Fort Street, but also on these adjacent streets, um, so we can figure out, you know, how we can activate the space, how we can get everybody working uh, together. Uh, in addition, um, Liz mentioned uh, beyond just the, the traffic issues, um, you know, a number of the exemptions that were asked for in this project are things that I, I think are, uh, from a, a building code perspective, you know, things that we might want to consider giving to, you know, all projects so they so people don't have to come and beg for exemptions here. And that's something that I'm hoping to work on uh, in, in bits and pieces as we move forward. I know we're doing a land use a revision uh, through Bill 10, but I think there's some building code issues that um, I'd like to work on in particular that hopefully will make it easier to do affordable housing projects. Um, in summary, you know, we do need more housing here. I hope that we can work out a situation, whether that's through Chaplin Lane, whether that's Fort Street, um, whether that's you know, some other intervention in the lane, um, but we do need the housing uh, moving forward, and I think we're, we're all in okay. agreement on that. Okay, thank you very much. Council Member Kiana, your thoughts on this particular 201H project? Get a pulse of the membership, if you don't mind. Uh, I support the project okay. and uh, also defer to the council member of the district uh, for all of the issues attendant to it. I, I will say this, and I said it at the other zoning hearing for all of the projects, because we are under a time crunch, it's uh, imperative that uh, DPP and the applicant 
work out any pilikia and of course uh, our remaining concerns and of course interface with your office. But um, uh, for, so any anyway, rate, uh, this is an imperfect process. We all know that. Uh, I think the question is how do we de decrease that imperfection uh, given the mandate that we've been given um, and I think any housing project, never mind 201H, is complicated. So even more so. So um, that's why we're here. I'm, I'm, I'm for moving this project forward. I uh, believe in the whole idea about revitalization. Of course, I'm concerned about the public safety and all of that, those other issues. But that's, in a way, not just the applicant, but all of us collectively uh, to work on. And we're conscious of that appreciate uh, all of the comments made uh, by individuals. And so I'm, I'm, I support this okay. project. Council Member Cordero. Hi, Chair. Yes. Hi. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to share. I do want to state, of course, I'm in support of this project. As for the, are we able to talk about the proposed CD1? Okay, relating to the proposed CD1, I believe that what is stated already in the resolution, the language is in, um, referring to TDM, TMP, and follow-ups thereafter, including number four re relating to the service lane, um, should be able to cover like uh, the discussions that we're having now. Um, without going ex explicitly into naming um, streets and whatnot. That is something that can and should be taken up with the applicant, with discussions with the department, and um, I feel that the proposed CD1 is, may not be needed. Mm -hmm. uh, but with that, I do support it. I do agree with um, the comments stated by the council member of the district regarding the building code and um, would look forward to see what his proposals are, are for that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Council member Weyer. Of course, thank you, Chair. Um, and of course, as you mentioned, definitely supportive of this project because we desperately need housing, um, particularly in the 60% MI and below range for Kupuna. I mean, can't get better than this project, so from all of for bringing it forward. I would, um, you know, of course, defer to um, the council member of the district in regards to, uh, you know, what he thinks is the best approach given the potential impacts on the community. I value compromise. Um, and so I'm super grateful that the amendment was put forward in the CD1. Uh, and so I have no qualms with it. I um, just would want to make sure, though, uh, that nothing in it could potentially cause um, problems for the project down the line, as um, Chair Waters was bringing up. Um, and so I'm, I'm, you know, would, of course, welcome, you know, and, and go along with Chair's final decision. Mahalo. Thank you. Chair Waters, would you like to have your input on just this discussion, even though you can't vote on it? Sure, thank you. And I feel pretty confident after hearing from DPP that they're gonna be able to work this out. Um, so I'll defer to you and the area council member as okay. to the exact language, but after hearing from DPP, they, they I think gave us enough assurance that they're gonna make sure that this project gets done, so thank you. Yes, Council Member Cordero. Chair, I just wanna clarify, I don't have qualms with the, with the condition here, I just think that we got it covered already in the original uh, resolution anyway. Thank you. Okay, doke. any other discussion for the members? Well, as, after having this lively discussion, the chair would like to recommend that resolution 23-11 be amended to the, is it the CD1? CD1, right? Posted on the agenda addendum as further amended as we discuss to incorporate amendments to condition B4, B.4, B.4, and the fit bid further resolve clause. Are there any discussions? Okay. Okay, if I am about to amend it, I do have an amendment, excuse me, members. And this amendment is tight. Can you folks get the handout? In the condition B4, that the traffic management plan must include the service lane and drop off and pick up area. And based on data from the updated 
traffic assessment show how two-way traffic will be accommodated, explain how pedestrian safety measures will be addressed, and demonstrate where and how refuse trucks. The handy van delivery, excuse me, the handy van service, delivery vehicles, and other vehicles will perform drop-off and pickup activities. The project's ground floor design must ensure that users of the service lane are able to safely exit without having to reverse out of the service lane onto Bishop Street. So what I did with staff was that the pro this is the amendment on the uh, CD1, that the project's ground floor design must ensure that users of the service lane are able to safely exit without having to reverse out of the service lane onto Bishop Street. So basically, we're trying to self-police ourselves. And the fit, be it further resolve clause is still the same to give them the option, this, the department. Okay. So any discussion, objections, or reservations? Hearing none, the resolution has been amended to the committee draft one. The chair re then recommends that the resolution 2311, co committee draft one, be reported out for adoption, which I verbally said what the amendments are. Are there any discussion, any objections, or reservations? Hearing none, so ordered. Thank you very much. You. Well, it's uh, 1142. There being no further business, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much for your patience and understanding in today's hearing. Aloha. Yeah.